Yeah, this, this is an introduction to writing high performance Julia. Uh, I think the experts are going to be bored, but if, if you're new to the, new to the language, I, I hope this is uh, useful for getting the performance out of the language. Yeah, the point is for that, I uh, hope to use the three hours to learn how to write Julia that's uh, generic, performant, and concise. The, of course, a lot of time when I hear somebody's optimized a, a code, uh, my first thought is, okay, they've made a total wreck out of it, and I'll never be able to read it again. Um, so the point of this talk is uh, not how to squeeze the last 1% out of the code by bloating it by a factor of 10, but how to leave the code in reasonably re readable form, but get good performance out of it. The presentation is focused on numerics, I'm not an expert on dealing with strings in Julia. I, I do lar largely Merck pr programming. Uh, floating point is my friend. Uh, and also, say, yeah, Julia and its compilers are evolving. So the, uh, any code dumps I show are from a recent snapshot of master. I, I use those instead of the current uh, re uh, 0.3 release, because the 0.3 release, the code was usually a little bit uglier. But uh, the, the advice here applies to, to the uh, current release also. I'm covering only single-threaded execution. Uh, Multi-threaded execution is covered by uh, the parallel workshop that comes after this one. Uh, my machine is not your machine. Any uh, performance numbers I quote, any times, they were on one particular machine on one particular day with one particular load on it. Don't hold me to them on another day. <laughs> under any other instance, or in another universe of, this, of the multiverse. And finally, the, uh, uh, if you've seen this, uh, the, the map maker's dilemma, how accurate do you make a map? If a map is perfectly accurate, it is completely useless because it is the reality. On the other hand, a map that is too painted with too broad a brush is also useless. I've, I've tried to strike a balance there. So when I start going into looking at like, the output of LLVM, don't panic. The, uh, that's largely to expl explain the motivations for some of the rules. I will summarize the rules with some fairly high-level guidance. The, uh, just to get a quick summary of the, the topics, the, I'll cover first the Julia tool chain. Then I'll go into a little bit about the hardware considerations, because to get performance out of a Julia program, you basically have to get performance out of the hardware. So you have to have a little bit of understanding how, how the hardware works. Then I'll go into the Julia type system, and that's where most of the action is. And we'll have a break, and I have a few easy uh, homework problems that I assign in class to do in class, since we're not coming back. The, uh, then we'll go into some of the optimizations, and particularly which, op which optimizations you can rely upon the compiler to do, and which ones you have to do by hand, and sort of the middle ground, the ones where you have to give it a nudge. And there'll be another break, and time to do a few more homework problems. And finally, uh, if there's time, I'll go into vectorization uh, of SIMD loops. I, if I don't have time, I can just say that, well, everything else I'm covering more or less leads up to that. And if you understand the rest, then the, the SIMD should be straightforward. How badly? Uh, I keep turning around to see if it's blinking. It is. It is. Yeah. Well, as long as there's one, one non blinking monitor. The uh, Julia tool chain starts out with you have some problem in your head you want, want to solve, and then you map that problem into Julia source code. And then the Julia compiler is going to take that source code and map it into machine code, and then the cores on the computer are going to map that machine code into a bunch of transistors flipping. Uh, some people, when they're coding machine code, think they're coding down on the metal. Not even close. These days, the, uh, the cores are busy retranslating those machine instructions into other stuff. So it's sort of like, uh, I, I, the problem is somewhat like bowling, in that you pick up the ball, you run up to the line, you release the ball, and then at that point, just the laws of physics take over, and it's supposed to knock down the pins. And in the same way, you only control the Julia source code at the top, and then the rest of it 
happens uh, beyond your control. So it's a job of predicting how to throw the ball so that when the compiler takes over, it will strike the pins. So just doing that blindly would be a bit tough. Fortunately, we have some, there's some profiler tools, so you can get some feedback as to how well you're doing. So there's like a time profiler and an allocation profiler in Julia, and I'll show a little more details on how to use those. So these, those give you some feedback as to indicate whether you're hitting the pins or not. There's also a second loop, you can also, it, which is unusual for uh, programming languages. From an interactive session, you can also look at the code being generated at several different levels, and that can be useful for debugging performance issues. Now there's two ways to do uh, time profiling on Julia programs. There's the profiler built into Julia, and it's very easy to use. You just say at profile in some uh, expression, and it'll call the expression and do a bunch of profile counting. And then to dump the profile, you can say profile.print. And usually the trick is to, if, if you don't care, if you're not intending to profile the just-in-time compiler, Normally, you run your program once, then you clear out the profile counters, then you run the profile again. The other way to profile a Julia program, if you're a total uh, assembly code geek, is to use uh, the Intel VTune amplifier. It has a graphical interface. You can poke and click your way down through call chains, and you can look at, at the assembly code view simultaneously with the source code. I, to use it, it does require building Julia from source and setting one of the options in your make.user file. So some basic uh, timing and profiling gotchas. If you're not interested in profiling the JIT, well, you sh should warm up the system first. There's also, well, it depends on context, sometimes people profile stuff. Yes? Uh, does somebody know the system? I don't, I don't know the, the, uh, the setup. Is everything tight? Does it have nothing to do with it? I don't think because it's, Cause it's, it's a specific, one. it's only one. It's only one, I know. So we seem to have a different. It's got to be upstairs. All right. All right. So one of the uh, basic, one of the newbie timing profiler gotchas is not warming up the system. So what the person is essentially doing is timing the, the uh, JIT and not their code. The other thing, even newbie in, in languages that aren't JIT, it often people don't well don't warm up the caches first on the machine. Now that may or may not be fair. In some codes, the caches really do start out cold, and you really if that's your real context, you really should, should be profiling that, but often you shouldn't be. So uh, another newbie startup is timing too short a run. If your code only runs a microsecond, uh, most of the profilers are not going to time that accurately. I usually insist upon at least a, on the order of a second run, or at least a tenth of a second. Uh, people want to do really precise profiling, let it run for minutes, but honestly, I, I only care about the factor of two or something, so rough profile does me just fine. Uh, another common mistake is timing something in a just a standalone context where a smart optimizer just completely removes the piece of code that you're intending to time. Uh, general rule with any compiler, do not depend upon obfuscation thinking that the compiler can't figure it out and remove the code. Because the compilers, they're trained to remove the code that's not necessary. And maybe your obfuscation works today, but might not work tomorrow. Uh, the best way I know to avoid this problem is print a value that requires actually doing the computation, like print out a hash code or something. So here's just an example of, of uh, warming up a system and how much a difference it can make. I have a, a simple function there. It goes through, it walks through an array and triples each element, and it's written out kind of a, a long hand. The, uh, and then I go, I go, uh-oh. 
generate some random numbers, and then I, I apply it to this array of numbers, and I time it, and then I time it again. And then I go print a hash code to make sure it actually did something. And if I actually, at the first time I time it, I get a time of about four milliseconds, which is, if you go through the math, actually a horrible flop rate. If I run it the second time, I'm down to 14 microseconds. The first time through, all I was doing was timing the, ti the time it took to run the just-in-time compiler to compile the, the, the function. And there also could be some cache effects here, too. Is so another important, just besides time profiling, heap allocation profiling is also important. To do this, there's an option with Julia, this dash dash track uh, allocation equal user option. And when you run Julia with that, it will create a file with a .mem extension that indicates, gives you a line-by-line -line breakdown of the allocations. Now, to use it requires a little bit of care if you really count the allocations right. The, uh, what you do is, the, if, like this, this function tally is the one I'm interested, at the top is what I'm interested in profiling the allocations of, but I need to wrap it to avoid some bugs in the allocation profiler. I need to call it from a wrapper function. Otherwise, I'll see a bunch of spurious a uh, allocations attributed to the first line of tally. And then I force compilation of the workload so I don't see allocations from the, the jitting. Then I clear the uh, allocation data. And then I make my final run where I'm actually going to run the compiled workload. So this is the idiom you need if you're going to do really accurate allocation profiling. So I, went I, I, was, I was trying this example initially without the wrapper and making sure it worked. And then I kept seeing these allocations at the very top. I was going crazy figuring out where they were coming from. So here's what the allocation profile looks like. And we'll go into why, why there's so many allocations. But if you look here, I'm doing it's just a simple reduction at the top. And yet there's 32,000 33, bytes of memory being allocated, which seems darn peculiar for a reduction. So that's a sign that something that there's a mismatch between the performance model in my head and what's going on inside the, the code. So we'll get down, uh, I'll cover the, the hardware resources, and then we'll get down to why that piece of code is messed up. So the hardware resources you have on a computer are, real, are fairly simple. There's memory and there's compute resources. So unfortunately, the memory resource is fairly complicated on the inside. You have a big chunk of memory shown at the bottom there. And, if that was, and the area of each of these blocks is drawn roughly to scale. Uh, if I draw them actually true to scale, some of them would be very hard to see. But the, the memory block, if drawn to scale, should be, have about 1,000 times the area of that outer level cache. So it would be bigger than the wall in this room. And then the, uh, the memory is connected to something called a, a, a cache inside the chip. It's a very fast memory. And the uh, data has to be pro uh, moved between the memory and the cache. And these connections here, as I've drawn them between the pieces, the length of it is the, uh, proportional to the latency, and the width is proportional to the bandwidth. So you can see that the, the stuff is transferred from the, the memory to the chip over what amounts to a, uh, it's like drinking through a coffee stirrer, only somebody has rudely crushed the coffee stirrer before you're allowed to drink through it. So that's a very preci uh, precious connection. So it's important once you have data in the, the cache to keep it there and use it. And then that cache may be connected to other caches. And finally, you get up to the registers, which is a little tiny piece of real estate. And another part of the memory that people often forget about is there's an instruction cache. And then there's a, that feeds an instruction queue. And if you run out of space on the instruction cache by uh, like going bananas with inlining, you can do a lot of damage. And some hardware has so-called hardware prefetchers. And largely from a high-level view as far as programming, that means that the hardware prefetches rec it recognizes regular stride patterns. That, like your program hits uh, locations that form an arithmetic sequence as far as the memory addresses. That can help a lot of programs. And the thing to remember is some techniques uh, actually des destroy that, 
Techniques that destroy that sequence may foul up the hardware prefetchers. So there's, there's basically, up in the corner, I've listed the, the three important parameters for a memory system. Yeah, there's the size at each level in the memory hierarchy, the latency, how long it takes to transfer stuff, and then the bandwidth, how fast you can transfer stuff uh, between the pieces. Because often there's the, the latency is basically how long it, it, it takes to get the first response out of the memory system, and then the, the uh, bandwidth is how fast you can transfer stuff once things are going. So the compute resources, there's basically you have sockets in your system. A lot of the laptops are single socket systems. Each of those sockets will have multiple cores, and each core will have multiple functional units. And those functional units can all operate in parallel. And the functional units have, a, like the memory, have a latency, and they have a throughput. And so, the, for example, the calculation, if one calculation depends on a previous one, it has to wait for the latency to start up. Whereas if two calculations are independent, they can both be running at the same time in the functional units, or immediately one after the other without the latency delay. Uh, we'll come back to an example where that has a significant effect. And then the uh, compute resources also have uh, SIMD units on them, single instruction, multiple data. And this is where the functional unit, instead of like just adding two numbers together, it'll add, uh, say, two tuple, tuples of eight elements each and do an element-wise addition. And on mo modern processors, the SIMD uh, addition, SIMD multiplication are essentially just as fast as single addition and single multiplication, only you get eight answers instead of one. So the ideal use of hardware, most programs won't hit this, but this is sort of the, the, the guaranteed not to exceed speed, is all the SIMD units are going at full speed. Most of the memory accesses hit the innermost cache. There's no stalls from cache misses. And if there are, maybe a few, it, it, it's unavoidable to have a few cache misses, but those are either hidden by uh, prefetching where the compiler or hardware is like looking ahead and pulling in data before you, the uh, calculations need it, or it's hidden by so-called the, the out-of-order pipeline in the processor where you write the uh, assembly code in one order, the machine actually does it in a different order, so that they can, if it gets stuck on something, it can go ahead and start working on other stuff and waiting for that thing that's stuck waiting on memory to be done a little bit later. And then there's also this hardware multi-threading. Like on the Intel processors, there's two hardware threads per core. So if one hardware thread is, total, is stuck, the other hardware thread can keep going. OK, one more remark about hardware is that one implication of the fact that a lot of calculations are bandwidth limited, because I said you're drinking that memory through a little thin coffee stir that's been crushed. The uh, float 32 is often significantly faster than the float 64, because you can it uses half the bandwidth. It only has half the cache footprint. You can cram twice as many 32-bit values in the cache as you can 64-bit values. And the SIMD units can process twice as many in one SWAT. So if you can tolerate 32, uh, single precision, uh, uh, go for it. Now, of course, if you're using less precision, you have to be careful. Make sure you're in, it's still good enough. I, I, I did this programming contest. Uh, back in the last fall in January, and I was using 32 bits because I thought I could get away with it, and I discovered a spot where it just wasn't quite enough precision. Okay, semantics versus implementation. The uh, just want to be clear on this: semantics is a, a language level idea that you are uh, uh, is about. Reasoning about the correctness of a program from the rules of the language. A common mistake I see sometimes is particularly among C programmers, probably less so among Julia programmers, is they argue the correctness of a program based upon a particular implementation. But the languages are normally defined with their own rules, and you have to sort of know those rules to argue about whether a program is correct or not. Now, as far as uh, performance, that's a different matter. You basically have to understand how it's implemented to get the performance right. So, and C and Julia have very different semantics for variables. So I think it's particularly if you come, how many people here are programmed in C or Fortran? Yeah, you're the ones with the problem. <laughs> yeah, so let, let's go through quickly the C semantics for vari variables. Uh, 
in C, a, I write a function like foo here, and I declare some variable x as an int, that says that's a variable, that, that x is a location in memory. And then when I assign to it, the, uh, initially, or initially the location has some undefined value in it, and woe unto you who assume it has a, a, a usable bit value, because LLVM is teaching, and Clang are teaching people that <laughs> a uh, uninitialized location is uh, not just random bits, it's way worse than that. Uh, and then I assign, assign a value to it, and then I assign, say here, 3.1 to it. Well, the 3.1, in, in C, 3.1, I, I said the location holds an int. I assign 3.1 to it, it's like, darn it, I'm going to fit that 3.1 in the box no matter what. So it's just going to convert it to an int and put it in the box. And then eventually the box disappears. Now, Julia is a different beast. Julia is more about, uh, by default, it delivers correct answers as opposed to fast answers. And so in Julia, I write the, a, a similar looking function here. But variables are no longer locations. A variable is a name bound to a, va a, math a, a value. So initially, if I say local x, it's not bound to anything. And if I try to use it, it it'll give you a runtime error. And then, the, uh, if I assign 2 to it, I'm just binding x to a value 2 somewhere out in hypothetical Julia space. And then if I rebind it to something, something else, uh, a 3.0, oh, sorry, it should be a 3.1 on this slide. Well, it, it matched the previous one. Okay, it matches the code here. Uh, if I bind it to a 3.0, yeah, it happily binds it to a 3.0. And, and the program works correctly, and there's no... None of this shoving a floating point value in an int location and truncating it. So in Julia, yeah, variables can be rebound unless they're marked const. So let's see where we. All right, now the way the compiler deals with that is something called boxing. And boxing, as I said, is important for getting correct answers, but it is not our friend for getting fast answers. So we're basically going to go, a lot of this is learning about how, how to avoid avoid boxing. So boxing's used any, any place where the compiler can't figure out the exact layout of the object at compile time. And the compiler works, the Julia compiler is actually very good about avoiding boxing as long as you give it a little help or don't do things to get, get in its way. So on the left there I have a, a func yeah, the function, and on the right I have what, uh, I, here I have two, two variables, there's y and x, now, the compiler can figure out that y only holds a floating point value, so it can allocate the uh, data directly in a, a box that it, it knows the layout for. For x, well, x is sometimes a, it's an integer, sometimes it's a floating point value, so the compiler says, oh, I don't know what's in there. And so it's gonna, it has to have a standard format that can represent either form. The easiest way is a pointer. So it has a pointer that points off to a little uh, a box, and the box contains a type tag on it, and the data itself. But the box data now carries the overhead that any time the compiler needs to, or the runtime needs to look at that value, it's going to have to read the tag and go left or right depending upon its integer or float, and so that's going to slow things down. Uh, we're also going to, yeah, we're going to pay for the inter, uh, indirection cost there, which is actually a very small, uh, a small cost. We're going to pay for the heap allocation. The boxed objects right now are always heap allocated. Now, maybe when Oscar uh, finishes the uh, fancy uh, d product domain uh, optimizations, maybe this will st maybe we'll start heap allocating some, or sorry, stack allocating some of these boxes, which are going to make it harder to track them down, actually. And finally, actually, the big hit, though, uh, the heap allocation is a, a significant hit on performance, but I think it's not the, really the biggest hit in many cases. The big hit is the generic dispatch. If I say x plus y, well, plus is a function call in Julia. The function has to figure out, well, which overload of plus, there's probably about 80, 80 of them or so, which overload of plus is, is intended here, and so it has to do a bunch of table lookup, and that's much slower than just doing a subroutine call. So to summarize, at the semantic level, Julia's source is, has, the variables are names, bound, they're bound to values, and the type direct declarations are optional. So the uh, names, the, the compiler tries to figure out what kind of types, uh, types of values the name are, are bound to. And then 
and the compiler is trying to bridge the gap from those semantics down to implementation at the machine code level where the values are stored in real f uh, physical memory locations and the values of unpredictable types have to be boxed because the actual machine instructions basically deal with only uh, types of operands that they know exactly what their layout is. There used to be some old machines. I used to use a, a, one of the Burroughs mainframes. actually had tagged values, but it's gone out of favor. The, uh, okay, the Julia compilation chain. I just showed it before. It's uh, just uh, one box of the Julia compiler. There's a few more stages in it, and it's worth understanding what the, state, uh, which state, what the stages do roughly and how to intercept them. The first stage parses the source into the syntax tree. Then macros are expanded. The syntax tree is lowered into a form of lots of go things like while and for become go-tos. Then the type inference is done. Then that code is translated into LLVM's inter internal representation. It looks like a, a basically a high-level machine code. The LLVM compiler optimizes it, and then it emits the machine code. And at each of these levels, or it's not all of them, but most of the important ones, you can dump the, the intermediate representation and take a look at it. And I'll, I'll show the details on this. So code lowered shows the uh, dump af after uh, just doing all the, the macro processing and the uh, lo uh, yeah, lowering down to the, the go-to form. So here's, it's not a terribly interesting level to look at. But, but it's the first one you can, you can take, a, take a peek at. And there's an example at the top of a function. And there's the code at the bottom. It's not, I, I said, this level's not, I don't find it terribly useful. And then there's also, recently, there, there was introduced a, a macro form. So you can call it, likewise, uh, with a macro. The macro is nice because you, you can say uh, the, the macro code lowered, and then you just give it an expression, and the top level function call uh, will be dumped. The, uh, the, other, the first form I showed, you give it two parameters. The first one's the function name, and the second one is the parameter types, a, a tuple of the parameter types. It needs to know the parameter types so it, to dump the code because there may be many overloads of, of the function. So here's the first one that's useful co code uh, for performance. Code typed, it shows you what types have been inferred for the code. So for example, here, if you look at, in blue are the, uh, the types that were inferred. So you can see that, for example, x and y have been inferred to be 64-bit uh, ints here. And the result of the, the subtraction is inferred to be a 64-bit int. But it's awfully tough. Uh, well, let's see, I'll show later. There's actually a nicer form of this. There's something called code uh, warn type that dumps it with the coloring and colors the ones that are be, uh, bad for performance. So the next level down, code LLVM. This shows the uh, LLVM representation of the function. And for this function here, it's, you don't have to, to uh, make a rough cut through this at this level. You don't have to understand LLVM IR in great detail. There's just a few red flag functions, and I'll, I'll show, show those a little bit later. But here's what it, look, here's what it looks like for this function. And there's also another, a, a macro form that you can give it a, a, at code underscore LLVM and give it a, an expression, and it'll dump the top-level call. And then finally, if you're an assembly code geek, um, you can read the uh, assembly code for your platform. I don't find the, the assembly code particularly uh, view particularly useful because it's, it's, it's like too low a level. And if I really look at that level, I'll drag out the Intel uh, V2 and amplifier and look at, be looking at profiles at that time. So roughly, of those levels I showed, the most useful level for detecting performance bugs, at least for me, is look at code LLVM, because there's some basically some red flag uh, operations that I look out for in there that tell me I'm in trouble. But then for understanding what went wrong, typically I, I go back to code typed or code warn type. And I'll show some examples. Oops, wrong way. Okay, concrete versus non-concrete types. Concrete types are ones for which the layout is fully understood. 
they're types that machines understand, like int. Int, depending upon your platform, is either 32-bit int or 64-bit int. But at compile time, if something's known to be an int, the compiler knows exactly how it's laid out in memory, knows exactly which machine instructions apply to it, and it's good to go. Likewise, vector of int, the compiler knows the exact layout of it and can compile code efficiently for it. A tuple of int float, fine. A type here, the, the structure type here, foo, we're good. It, the compiler's happy with that. Oops. Then there's non-concrete types. These are the ones that the hardware cannot execute or de execute directly, deal with directly. Types like any, which means, like it says, could be anything. Uh, integer, which means it could be a 8-bit int, a 16-bit int, 32-bit int, could be a big int, could be anything that declares itself as a subtype of integer. There's union types, which by definition are the union of it could be one of these, uh, like there uh, could be that uh, int or sorry, there's a typo there, 32 int should say int 32. Or a vector of t. At that point, as a parametric type, we haven't instantiated the t yet, so we don't know what it is. And then there's sort of an intermediate ground. Uh, tech I, I think of these as quicksand types. They're not, quite con they're not concrete, and they're not uh, totally non-concrete. So if you have a, a type definition here, like circle, the compiler knows, yeah, it's got an x, y, and r. But what it doesn't know is what the types of x, y, and r are. They're any, as far as the type system is concerned. And so the compiler, to lay that out in memory, yeah, it's going to lay out little boxes for x, y, and r, but it's going to have to box the contents. So there are going to be a bunch of pointers off the, the other pieces. So it's going to require the box, and we're going to take the hit from the uh, heap allocation and the dynamic dispatch. So we might, improve this, think we might improve the situation a little bit. We can say they're real. But unfortunately, that still requires boxing, because real includes float 32, float 64, somebody's uh, what is it, very high precision float. So once again, the boxing is still required, so it's, it's still going to be slow. If we really want to nail it down, we need to tell the compiler, yes, the, these fields are specific types. A specific concrete type. So this is now a concrete type. Can I ask a question? Yes. Can I yeah. Go back to um, maybe two slides when you first started talking about uh, concrete types. Uh, maybe you can like, okay, there. You've got a type two there, and I, and I see that that's concrete, and I see the vector of int is concrete. What if I had a vector of two? What is the layout of that in terms of boxes? It will be a, it, it will, the power will understand it, it's laying out a bunch of Bo uh, bu laying out a bunch of boxes of foo. So it'll be, there will be no, the, it will in effect be, a, in C terms, it would be an array of structures. In each structure, the fields are pointers. Does that make sense, sense or? Each array element is a pointer to a No, each array element will be a, stru a struct. Oh. oh, OK. But each, each, each field within that struct will be a pointer. I think I get. Yeah, foo, foo is concrete, so it would, the compiler understands the layout of foo. Right, so if it understood the layout of foo, then it created Oh, oh, but sorry, foo is not, foo is a, a mutable type, uh, excuse me, foo, foo is, no, foo is a, yeah, it's concrete, so it should be. It should just be an array of. Array of struct. It, right? it should be an array of struct at that point. Yeah, there's no point in the box. Yeah, but the, but the foo itself, the elements, depending upon how they're declared, they'll be point. Right, but in this case, they just all. Sorry, the fields. Right. And there were some, sometimes there, there's, there's been some, uh, I think it's with tuples, the layout before there were some issues, like an array of tuples was not laid, at, laid out like you think it would be for efficiency. There was next level of indirection, and I think that was fixed recently. Was it? I, I have been following real closely. Okay, the, the impact of the, oh, oh, let's see, oh, the other point, yeah. 
the way, if you need the generality, the way to get it back is to, instead of declaring each field to be a, a real, is like, if I want here a circle of float 32 or float 64, is use a parametric type. Have a type parameter, and then declare each field to be uh, of that type, and then instantiate it for float 32 or float 64. It's like here's a circle of float 64, the compiler can figure it all out. If you're a C++ programmer, you can think of a parametric type as a, they, they quack like temp, a lot like templates. And then, but if I do a circle of real, now I'm back to, well, each element is, could be one of several concrete types, so there's going to be the, the boxing again. Yes? Because there's probably other people can answer this better. It's a question of code efficiency because the way right now generic dispatch is done, it clones the code for every each unique set of parameter types, and I think there's some fear that if it starts cloning at that level of detail, it may have a code explosion. Oh, Would it be able to no, currently the inference mechanism, as far as I know, doesn't do that. In principle, somebody, you know, it's one of those uh, master's thesis projects to do that, probably. But being a dynamic language, the trouble is, something, you might, the trouble is you're never sure somebody's going to type something in that destroys your assumptions, so now you have to keep track of what you need to undo and regenerate. Let's see, so yeah, there's a big impact here. Here's an example of a piece of blinking code. <laughs> the, uh, oh, you think? Yeah, it's probably worth it. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's try let's try re re reboot. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead and do a reboot because it, it's getting really annoying. Okay, 
try to do? Is everybody looking? No. 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 Yes. Around these two dice examples. Something at the bottom is going. Oh, no, the screen is shaking. Right. This is this is just a this is just a. No, it's the bottom scan line is. What's that? I, I can do that. That's that's the easy part. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. I, t I took the, d the witch, put the adapter back in the sequence, or? Uh, you have to use a different computer? I mean, I, t I took out the adapter to shorten the. Are you on a Mac? No, I'm on a PC just going straight VGA. Yeah. Well, why would just maybe a refresh? I th just a second. I'm not sure. Oh, oh, the, that's what's okay. A second. Let's get. Wait. Oh, this is. It really wants 75 <laughs> All right. This one is too. Okay. That's too. That's too high. Okay. All the way down. Oh, I can raise that by the way. So that we can see what the difference. Okay. And then I need to get the refresh rate down. Right. <laughs> Just the rate down. Keep 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 changes. Oh, where where the refresh rate go? Oh, here. Then where's the refresh rate? If advanced, where is it? Down, down right. Oh, oh, there. Okay. This is what I love about the monitor. We love to debug video. Now 59 hertz. 59, it's it's good the way it is. No? Yeah, yeah. But change it to what? Slightly to the right. right. But it's 59. Oh, you want 60? Yeah, it's, it wants 75 according to a. Oh, it wants 75. Yeah, 75. We could try the 60 if you want to. Yeah, 60. But it says 75 as the recommendation. That was not enough to make sense. Yeah, what wasn't there? There's some override. Maybe it was higher. Maybe it was higher. Maybe it was higher. Well, it's not really working. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, we'll see. Let's see. Where's. I got to get my cursor back. I think there's some sort of override for it, but. <laughs> I mean, I could try the 75. I mean, 75 troubles the. the uh, it's just manipulating the. Uh, no, it's, it's on uh, PowerPoint. It's. Where's the? <laughs> the second. Let, let me try 75. I'll, I'll get 75. There, there's a way to override these things. No, wait. No, where is it? Oh, hi. No, I can't. 
As long as they won't give me 75. Uh, possible. Yeah, unfortunately, the AV crew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here it's, yep, it's back to, let's try that. Okay. First, okay. Landscape, like that, that. And how do I, oh, I gotta say. Hit a five rather than. Yeah. So, so, oh. so, so while they're doing the technical stuff, maybe I'll also... All right. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> I can't. All right. Now I just have to get this. <laughs> Again, I can adjust the position. That's not the hard question. Now I just have to get this. The, uh, uh, I've run out of window space. Where's um, the... You may be able to overlay the windows. Oh, I just have to oh. find the window. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. All right. Not yet. All right. Well, let's go before it blinks. <laughs> I'll fiddle with this, but go ahead and we'll, we'll get it perfect. Yeah. The, uh, okay, yeah, the, just the, the, the timing impact here. The, uh, I, I tried to experiment with the uh, instantiating this circle type for two, two different, uh, for concrete type and abstract type. And you can see here, for, for the re when I instantiate it for real, the time for this code, it, it's searching for circles that touch or overlap. It's like 86 milliseconds. And then once I use a concrete type, the time plummets to only 1.2 milliseconds. So, yeah. So the more, more the, uh, the the point of this is that you you want you want to be really nice to the compiler's type inference for code to run efficiently. And there's roughly there's uh, about six different places where you have to worry about the types of things. And these six different places, some of them have basically different levels of thinking about well who who's taking care of it. The uh, if it's a parameter. Largely, the, the compiler takes care of it, because in Julia, it will create a custom version of the function for each different uh, kind, uh, types of parameters. Uh, global const variable. Global variables are marked const. The compiler knows exactly the uh, ty type and value of those, so those aren't a big issue. Local variables and return values, those are inferred by the compiler, and those are the ones we have to be careful about, to not get in the way of the uh, compiler type inference. There's fields of structures, as I showed, those are pretty much you uh, get what you declare. And finally, global variables are, the compiler knows almost nothing about them because it doesn't know if you're going to, what you're going to assign to a global variable in the future. So yeah, be nice to type inference. Julia, because this, this is the big performance issue. If there, there's a factor of 50 uh, to be gained off, off of code, it's usually from being nice to type inference. Because it said Julia functions are polymorphic. They handle many different kinds of data. But the hardware is dumb as rocks monomorphic. It only handles one shape of each instruction only handles one shape of data. So, and when the type is uncertain, the, uh, the, the compiler uses boxing to deal with it. And the boxing incurs heap allocation and garbage collection overhead and runtime dispatch of calls. And the call can't be inlined. So the, the, the inline is almost a nitpick after the, the, the offense of the uh, table scanning. So here's an example of code that has this uh, issue with the uh, type inference. The code is on the left. Now it's blinking again. It again. Yeah. All right, the example function there, it's uh, assigning a value to y. And here's the, co the code LLVM. If you take co code, 
code LLVM and look at it, the code is actually very reasonable here. That, that's actually very good code, as long as I apply this QUX function to an int. Now, if I apply QUX to a float, things go really bad. If you dump the code, you'll see lots and lots of gobs of code. And the red flags here are the ones marked in red there. You'll see stuff about PGC stack. This has to do with garbage collection. And then the box float 32, well, that's it's boxing. That screams, yeah, it's doing boxing. And then there's the uh, runtime dispatch here at the bottom, this JL applied generic. So that says something went very wrong. And now to track that down, we can use this uh, code typed or code warn type that's in Julia 0.4 to look at the what types were inferred for things. And if we run that, we find that the type for uh, Y was inferred to be, well, it could be a float 32 or an int 64, because, well, if Y is assigned, Y is assigned, takes the path where it's assigned a zero, well, then it's assigned an int, but if it takes the path where it's assigned X, well, it gets whatever the, its type is whatever the type of X is, and in this case, it was a float. So there's where the, uh, the, the union in the, in the code typed or code uh, warn type, the thing to look out for is the union types, because that says the compiler can't figure out what it's dealing with. There's also non nice thing about uh, code uh, type warn. Sorry, warn. Type warn, the nice feature of that is it also it not only colors the union types, it also colors the non concrete types. Now, how do we fix this? Well, the easiest way is I can just stop people from calling my function on non-int non types. Now, this will solve the problem. The code's now, the, 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 value, the, the uh, type of Y is now stable. But the nasty thing is that the code's no longer generic. I might as well be writing Fortran at this point. So there's a couple of different ways to fi fix this right, and it's a matter, of somewhat, a matter of personal preference and a matter of what you're trying to accomplish. The uh, one way here is, and a, a, probably a good way in this example, is in the, the upper left corner there. I, instead of assigning a zero to y, I assign it a zero of the correct type. And there's a function in Julia called zero that takes an argument and kicks back, gives you back a zero of the same type. On the uh, upper Right, there's another way I can do this by uh, making the function parametric, which in effect lets me grab the type of x easily. And then I ask, ask for a zero of that type. Uh, lower left, another parametric example, I can use convert to get a value of the type I want. So you have to be careful. I'll show an example later where convert can actually not solve the problem. So I'd be a little careful using convert to do these sort of fixes. And then in Julia 0.4, it's probably going to be, I think, the preferred means in that release is you use the, what looks like a, a type constructor. It's a, basically, it's, a fun, it's, really, it's a function call with the, na the type name as the uh, name of the function. And you, you call it around zero, and it, it gives you the right, the, uh, zero of the right type. So after repairing this function, now if I invoke it on a float and I, write, I look at code LLVM, I get very reasonable looking code. All those red flags about PCG stack and generic dispatch and the boxing disappear. Right. Yes? Ah, yes. Yeah, that's the thing. You don't just shoot down every constant in the uh, function. It's basically you have to look at places where a variable is assigned in two different places, the way, place to look out for. Yeah, the one here is not an issue because the compiler, once it can figure out the type of y here is a float, and it says float plus integer, and there's a bunch of conversion rules in Julia that says, well, here, float plus integer, I know what the result type is for that. It's going to be a float by the conversion rule. So yeah, it's not a problem. So, so yeah, it's not shooting every constant in the code. It could get pretty ugly. It's places where there's a merge point. Okay, I, I haven't figured it out. I've been thinking of trying to do an exercise where I have a code which is gobs and gobs of constants, and the exercise would be to find the offending constants and 
not hit the ones that, where it doesn't matter. So a common idiom, and this is probably the, the easiest one for a beginner to step into, is reduct, uh, handwritten reductions. Uh, typically, you, like uh, to sum up a bunch of numbers, you assign uh, an accumulator a zero value, and then you accumulate a bunch of values, uh, you sum in a bunch of values into it. And this code is going to run very slowly because the value of s, it has type int coming in uh, initially, but then once I add v to it, well, v is a float. Now I have int plus float. I get a float. The float gets stored into s, and now s, the compiler says, oh, s is either it's a float or an int. And worse yet, I'll show some other examples of that. If this happens, the return type of the function isn't certain either to the compiler, because the s, if it's a zero trip loop, well, s came back as an int. Otherwise, if it wasn't a zero trip loop, s came back as some other type. And so now, not only is tally done damage to itself internally for performance, it's damaged its caller. So a way to fix that is you initialize the, the accumulator variable with a zero of the uh, same type as the uh, which you intended to, uh, the, type of, the type you really want to use for the accumulator. So in this case, it's the element type of the array. So I said, yeah, you can point, the, the, the damage is not only within the routine, it can poison its callers as far as type inference. Here's an example of a code that, well, it's a good exercise, particularly I think at the high school level, is write a function that does the quadratic equation and hits all the corner cases correctly. Uh, this one doesn't. It's missing the case where a equals 0 or b equals 0. There, there's a few other fun cases. But just even just this simple version, you know, you learn, well, if the discriminant is not negative, the, re the, the result, the roots are real. Otherwise, they're conjugate roots. Well, the temptation is, well, I write code like this and handle the real case and then the uh, conjugate case. And yeah, the, the answer is correct. It's, it returns a pair of the roots. The bad thing is it, it's not, the, the result is, might be a, a pair of reals or, or, sorry, a pair of floats or it might be a pair of uh, complex. So here's, let's see, yeah, here if I run it through code warn type, the, uh, and just say, here, the, the at the uh, macro form expects a, 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 call, a, a call site, so I just give it some, it doesn't matter what the coefficients are, I just hand it some. And so here I can see I, I hand it some coefficients. If you look at the code warn type, there's a lot of output for the rest of the, the, the function body. But at the very end, you'll see it has tuple of number comma number. So it knows it's returning a pair of numbers, but number's an abstract type. It's not concrete. So it doesn't know exactly what concrete type is being returned. So yeah, there's various solutions you could do for this. Uh, one possible solution is you just say, well, I'm always going to return a pair of complex numbers. It's probably the most straightforward. So here I'm casting, in the real case, I'm casting or converting the real roots to complex roots to fix the problem. Now, I, I, earlier I remarked, well, what if a is 0 and b is 0 in those cases? You've got to decide what to do about that. Like if a is 0, yeah, I could use a linear, treat it as a linear equation. But if a and b are both 0, that's a nasty case, because either then any value of x satisfies or no value of x satisfies. At that point, well, maybe I use NANs, or maybe I throw an exception. As far as the type inference is concerned, it'd actually, actually be preferable to throw an exception rather than return something of a different type. So just to see if people are paying attention, here's a pop quiz. Which of the following functions are type stable? That is, the return, type of the return value can be predict it is independent of the argument's value. As it, it, something is type, type stable if knowing the type of the argument is sufficient to knowing the, the, the type of the result. So I guess, show, since we have a large group here, show of hands, the first function. Uh, how many people think it's type stable? Yeah. Uh, it's going to return 0 or 1. They're both in integers. Yeah, that, that's one's a no-brainer. 
What about the second one? How many people think it's type stable? Uh, how many people think it's type stable most of the time? <laughs> yeah, anybody want to call out, when would it not be type stable? When what? Well, yeah, it's only, if somebody hand you to, if the minus returned a different, minus of x returned something of a different type than x, that's where you'd be messed up. I think minus unsigned is still unsigned, it's just, it's a modulo thing. So I, I guess that, that's sort of one lesson to take from that is don't return really screwy types that are algebraically counterintuitive. Uh, okay, the next one, g of x, here's an innocent attempt to like take out a discontinuity in a function. Uh, how many people think it's type stable? All right, yeah, it's, how many people think it's not type stable? <laughs> yeah, it's, the only way it could possibly type st be type stable is if, uh, what, it, the sine of x would have to return some type that when divided by the type of x returned an int, and there's nothing in the standard library that does that. <laughs> that would be really rude to add definitions that did that. Okay, and the last one, that looks like a, a, a how many people, is that type stable? Is it type stable under some conditions? Yeah. It's type stable, as long as x and y have the same type, you're, you're good. So actually that one, it might make sense to fix it by, say, adding a type uh, abstract, uh, a type parameter that says, well, these both have to be of type t. Or if you look in the Julia Bates library, they do some conversion magic so that x and y get promoted. Okay, global variables. This, uh, uh, before I had a list of various uh, where identifiers happen and the, where, whether the compiler infers types or not. This is the worst case. No type inference is done for reassignable global variables right now. The problem is Julia is a dan dynamic language. So as you're typing stuff in, you could assign something of a completely different type than anything it's seen before. So the workarounds are, one is to avoid global variables. At some point as undergrads, most people will go through that phase where, oh, global variables are terrible, you can't have any of them in your program. And eventually you come to your senses and realize some things should be global variables. Uh, you can declare single, if a, global variables are only assigned once. If it's a parameter, basically a global parameter to the program, uh, prefix it with const. And then the compiler knows it's only assigned once and can depend upon its type not changing. You can use an explicit type check or force conversion, or you can pass the parameter to a helper function. So here's an example with the problem. I have a global, a function, a blinking function foo, uh, with a glo global variable beta there. And every time the code references that global variable beta, it's going to have to ch check the type there. And the type inference is going to basically give up on the types of anything inside that loop. And the code, it's going to be slow. And then what I can do, well, if I know beta doesn't change for the run of the program, I can prefix it with const, and then the program, the uh, compiler knows that beta is of that type. So here it knows it's a 64-bit float. Or I can uh, drop a hint and tell the compiler, basically every time I load beta there on the uh, right, I, I, I put a type assertion after it, and what that does, that inserts a runtime check that checks that beta's, uh, a, a, on each load, checks that it's a float 64, so I'm going to pay for the runtime check, but after that, the, comp the compiler note can infer that after the check, if the check succeeded, the, the type was a 64-bit float. But the bad thing about these solutions is that I've lost some of the nice generic properties of Julia, because I have either, let's see, with the const, that says I can't change beta, and with the explicit check, that says, well, beta always has to be a 64-bit float. So I, it, my code's no longer as generic as it could be. So a way to fix this is to use a helper function so on the left there is the, the same code, the same original slow code. And then on the right is the faster version. And what I do is I, now foo of x is just going to be a, a function that 
loads the global variable and passes as a parameter to the function that does the real work, this foo underscore aux. And then what Julia is going to do is that foo aux, when it calls that, it's going to do the generic dispatch thing and dispatch to a version of foo aux that's customized to the types of its parameters. And now beta is the parameter, become the parameter b up there. So it's going to have a version customized to whatever that type of beta is at that moment. And then the type inference is going to do its wonderful thing. Yeah? Isn't this a flavor of I personally would like to, I, I mean, I don't know if the designers would approve of it or not. I would like to have like a type const <laughs> assertion on global variables, which are, I mean, semantically, there's a way to define it. Basically says if you assign to it again, it does an assertion check and throws if it was wrong. But yeah, right now, this is what we have to work with. Act switch? But Oh, yes, yeah, the con well, you overwrite const things at your, yeah, at your peril. I've done it <laughs> during an interactive session. It's like, it's so tempting. Uh, is, is it, uh, I mean, is it possible to have something like a training mode in which you train the function to have particular values based on certain that, inputs, and then the program can assume it's a const from that moment? I think in the long term, that would be a nice mode to have, because at least the training, it could train the, with a profile, yeah, so-called profile-guided optimization, where you know the common case, then a lot could be done. So I think in the long term, maybe something like that will show up. So our experience at Intel has been with profile-guided optimization, at least for C++, a lot of customers resist. They don't want to take the time to run the training, training run. So in the JIT environment, since they're already running, maybe we have a hope of doing profile-guided optimization. Now let's see, one gotcha solution I tried, yeah, while doing these slides, I tried a solution that doesn't work. And so it's good to hear about what doesn't work. Um, this one I thought would fix the problem because I'm, I'm loading beta, I'm converting it explicitly to the element type of X. I figured, hey, I'm good to go. But it turns out, since the compiler, it doesn't know that the, uh, it'll know the ty element type of X, it doesn't know, it doesn't know the type of beta because there's nothing magic about convert. It's just a function. It turns out it has no guarantee that convert of uh, t comma x is going to return type, something of type t. There's no guarantee there. So in fact, that this solution doesn't work. The reason the convert worked in the earlier example is the compiler could infer the types of both arguments going into it, and it knew exactly which overload it was dispatching to. And there, then it knew the return type. So a way to fix this is, if you're going to go this way with the explicit conversion uh, written that way, is you write the uh, a type assertion for the element type. And with Julia 0.4, the problem is solved. Uh, it turns out Julia 0.4 defines, since it allows overloaded call, the, uh, the long way I wrote it out now can, can be written, Julia 0.4 is just basically a, a conversion to the element type. And there, because it's that element type conversion is written like the top line, the overload of call, which has the type assertion at the very end. If you look on the very right, that top line, it does the, uh, has the type assertion there. So long term, that's probably the preferred way to do those conversions. But still going to be, you're still inside that loop. We're still going to, even in that style, we're still going to, we're going to pay for the type assertion. So it's still, there's going to be a branch, a check, check where we have to throw. That's still going to be slower than passing it in as using the helper function and using a parameter. Oops, let's see, where, which one am I going? Okay, const. Just a word of warning, because const doesn't mean what it means in uh, C++, or it sort of means, but <laughs> const just means the identifier is not, never rebound to another object. 
a constant Julia does not mean that the object doesn't change, well, unless it was a mutable object. So for example here, I assign an uh, array to a cont variable, and then yeah, I can modify it. I can assign to elements inside it. That's all fine. What I can't do is rebind a completely new array to it. So the way to think about that is, is shown on uh, the, the lower right there, is that A is known to point, because it's const, is known to point to an object. That object, it can't switch out that object for another object, but that object itself may have some levels of indirection pointing to other things that may be modified. Or even in the case of the array, some of the shape information can change. So to summarize, yeah, the, the type guidelines for Julia. Uh, Julia, it specializes the function, so you don't have to worry so much about parameter types. The, the compiler will generate a custom version for those parameter types. So in general, putting type declarations on parameters won't buy you any performance. And still, there are good things to have to prevent accidents. If your function really only works on reals, I mean, I'd certainly just add the real type assertion there to make sure it's not called on something else, particularly during interactive sessions when one can be clumsy. The, uh, but it won't help performance. Uh, the type inference is it's done by so-called forward flow in, inference. It's basically as the, it's like a, a summary of how the program executes from, from the start. The, uh, and and code's going to perform slowly if the inference can't figure things out. And typically what you worry about is where flow, where it splits and then rejoins. It's where it rejoins, you want to make sure that type, the types coming in are the same for a given variable. The, uh, and then the other thing is lack of concrete types. And hardware deals with concrete types. So you use code typed or code, I keep swapping that. Is it code type worn or code worn type? I, it's worn type. Thank you. Write that down. Oh. I, th I, th I think I like to have it right in my brain now, but my fingers refuse. <laughs> And also, avoid using global variables and kernels. Always like, load your global variables into as parameters, and then call the, a routine that does the heavy, the CPU-intensive stuff. Or use const. So that said, let's see, I have uh, time for a break. And I have a few simple exercises that can be downloaded from my website. They're real, they're, they're real easy. Uh, the, the archive from the website has actually four exercises. Two of them involve some more stuff. Though I guess the, the exercise three you can start on, because some aspects of it I, I covered the stuff. But let's, let's take a break and work on these two for, for a little bit. And let me know if you, yes. Oh, oh, yeah, though in a sense that when I typed it to a concrete type, I was just stopping users from using it inefficiently. So it's philosophical whether it's helping or not. I was, when I typed it, when I had the parameter typed as a concrete type, I really wasn't helping the compiler generate inefficient, more efficient code. I was stopping users from calling inefficient code. You don't have a single um, Or, or, yeah. That's great. Ninety percent of the time, if I'm passing an int, I'm passing oh, an index. So I'm sure if you're passing a float, I'm going to expect both anyway. Yeah, sure. So if that's the case. Yeah, and maybe if you want to stop the user from accidentally using it in an inefficient way. Um, but normally, yeah, the compiler will uh, even let's see, if you have an abstract type on the uh, parameter, it's still going to do a custom clone. I think right on the current right, but the compiler. Idea. Well, oh, prevent it from ever being called in a context where, you, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm just writing in C, so I have no problem with it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's easier, especially if you're writing libraries. Yeah, and certainly in the, yeah. And, and the, in the base library, too, you'll see lots of overloads for float 32 and float 64, different overloads, because people know something about the precision.
Yeah. yeah. You had a function that simply accepted, it accepted X as a parameter and then, um, and then called the two parameter yeah. with a global variable and things. So that actually, I don't, I don't believe that the code that gets generated there is specialized either. These are still. No, that, that's not specialized. That's still, yes, generic dispatch at that call, that call. But the call Lee is now specialized. But though, it, can you go back to that slide? Uh, if people have got the down, I, I got the download link. Yeah, there's yeah. the problem. Um, so the point, the point is that the code that, like, if I if I had some, if I did that and my beta was a float and my, um, you know, my and my x value was an integer and I called <coughs> foo of integers, it still wouldn't. The compiler still wouldn't be able to infer that the beta uh, that it used um, within the method foo is actually a float because that's a global. Well, no, it infer actually the the the, 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 the foo, within the foo it can infer it, but then it does a, a generic dispatch um, and says it's looking for a foo that takes it so, so take it, takes a float. So it will it will generate it will generate a specific code for foo aux, right? Yeah, foo aux is one. But like foo itself. Oh yeah, foo itself. You're still paying for generic dispatch. So yes. So I didn't want anybody to think that right. You know that that foo would be able to specialize based on. Oh the global right. Right, this dispatch is on the callee side, not the, yeah, yeah, the, the caller there. So it's, it's kind of an example of, of the poisoning the well thing. Yeah. Is that making any sense? Because I thought you, S will get messed up. And it S, oh, S 0, 0. OK, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, 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 that's one, one way to fix that's it. That's one yeah. way to fix it. But then I said, OK, well, if I'm going to pass uh, these many integers in, the range of integers as B, and then time it, I should, again, start blowing up because no, no, you should be good because it has its floating point, and then there's you, you're passing I mean, in integers into this function here as a. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's okay actually because it knows it's a float. And then as you go in here, you're adding int times times int int times int. We know what that type is that to a oh, float. So it's but in float, it's float. It's really so float. So it knows it's float. Yeah. Okay. So it, all the types are known. Okay. So that's yeah, that's getting back to that discussion, not nuking all the constants yeah, in the yeah, yeah. in the program. Yeah.
stuff. Doing other stuff, yeah. <laughs> Jesus. The C is also involved in the movie. Oh, no. C is always the key word. Yeah. Yeah. All right. The, uh, have we uh, have enough time to at least look at one, one and two? All right, let, let's discuss. I mean, there's more than one right answer to these things. So, here I'll, I'll show what I show what I did, but I won't claim it's any the one true. I will. I, I won't try, claim it's one true way. Uh, where is let's see. Hang on, I had a diff. Where my diff? Oh, diff fell off the end there. Oh, this is really hard manipulating <laughs> windows like this. Uh. Ah. It's walked off the edge of the screen. All right, my, my fix for the first problem was the, uh, the element type of the S, the accumulator variable, was being assigned a zero, and it really needs to be a zero of the correct type. The, uh, very gen the general solution is to initialize it with a, using that zero function. A uh, partial solution, if you're only interested in numerical arrays, would be a, a let's see, I'm gonna say, well, a partial solution, if you assign like a z initialize with 0, 0.0, that solves the problem for a, uh, integers and floats, though it's a little subtle, subtle why, it, why it works. Um, and it has to do with that, that rule about before, when we, if you initialize it with a, uh, like a float 64, well, the first time it does a sum, if you pass in an array of integers to sum, it uh, loads a, it, load, it does, says float plus int, oh, I got a float, I'm fine, and then going back around, it's float plus int, float plus int, it always comes back with a float. But this is a very general solution because this will work correctly if, say, uh, if we're dealing with the arbitrary precision reals. The uh, other, let's see, the other one. It's real. 
Now, the, the variable c, the, the c in there, that constant c that flip-flops, that was fine. The, the system can figure out the, it, it's, it's just a sign, well, it, it's just negated each time. So it, the compiler can figure out, it starts out as an int and it keeps fl flipping sign, but it's always going to come back. The negative of an int is still an int. Oh, yeah, there is. Uh, actually, it does. It, it'll get you some performance. Yeah, good, po good point. Um, yeah, it will get you some performance improvement because if it starts out as a float, float times, uh, uh, it doesn't have to convert. The, the hardware only knows about float plus float and float times float. The hardware has to do a conversion from int to float, and that yeah, adds an extra cycle. Or more so, yeah, because it, it's on the, it's on the uh, dependent, if you say the dependence change and the latency, it, it's on that chain, and int the float surprisingly bad for latency. Let's see. And here, let's see the second one. Um, Yeah, this one was, uh, I'm trying to trick the experts, but I probably didn't do a very good job of it. it the code looks like, well, gosh, if, if, the, if, there's no remain, if there's no remainder modulo 2 and I divide by 2, well, surely that's an integer, right? Well, no, in, in Julia, the division is def, uh, on integers is defined to return a floating point value. So it works like uh, division normally works for mathematicians as opposed to Fortran people. Uh, so the fix is, and, and trouble is that the floating point value, and then on the other branch path, it's uh, still an integer, so now the compiler says, oh, the return type is either integer or float, and the way to fix that is to divide by two in some way that returns an integer. If you're a computer person, you know that shifting the value right one place will do the trick. If you're not a bit twiddler, the other way, there's an operation in Julia called div, it takes two arguments. It does integer division. That's the other way. The shift, I think, is slightly faster than the div because a sign div involves a, a little more than just a right shift. Is what? The right shift? No, the, the div, the compiler can optimize a div by a constant 2 down to uh, some bit twiddling. There's no actual division instruction, but it's, it's more bit twiddling than a right shift. Oh, yeah, good point. I probably should type constrain the uh, parameter to be integer just to stop accidents would be my inclination since this particular problem this is solving is strictly integers in the first place. Okay. That, that, that would be, I, I would probably just type constraint the integer and be done with it, yeah. Let's see, I hit the right. Hailstone, oh, it's because the number, if you look at the way the numbers cycle, they, the, it, you, you plug a number into h, and then you apply h of h of, h of x, and it, 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 the numbers get very big sometimes, and then they fall back down and one, a, 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 very low, and then they go back up again. And the I think it's a, still, an, I'm not sure, I think it's still an open question in mathematics whether there's numbers that have cycles that don't eventually get, reach one. I don't, Anybody know if the question's been closed or not? Or? It's still open. It's still open? OK. Let's see, where are we at time? All right. Let's see, where are we? Oh, good. OK. So yeah, that was enough discussion of types. And I said, those, those are where the, the factor of 50 screw-ups happen. Yeah, now we're down to probably more prosaic stuff that applies to Fortran and C also in some ways. But uh, the first one is, yeah, re reuse temporary arrays if you can, because uh, reusing objects is faster than reallocating them. 
Now the new garbage collector in Julia 0.4, it greatly re reduces the impact of this optimization. It's almost kind of disappointing. I tried an example, reused an array, and like, oh yeah, it was a big impact with Julia 0.3, and now it's greatly shrunk. So here's an example. I dumbed down a uh, life simulation enough to fit it on a slide. Fit it on a slide. The uh, this is just a over one dimension, a simple one dimensional uh, was a one dimensional linear cellular automaton. That's really dumb. Um, but here, th this code on the left is it, it, the input is an array of uh, it's supposed to be an array of booleans. And it generates a, a similar generates a, a array of the similar shape and type. And then I go through and fill that array. And then the call, what the caller is doing is going basically going to keep calling. You can see the, the blue code, the blinking blue code uh, down at the bottom there, state equals next state. And each time it calls next state, it's going to allocate another array. So it's more efficient if the uh, code can recycle the array and not keep allocating it. So for he here, it's fairly obvious what to do. At the, at the bottom in, in the caller, I allocate the array once, and then I, I cycle it, I call next state, and it fills the array. And then the call, in this case, the caller swaps the two arrays. You can't always do that. Sometimes you have to do some other kind of bookkeeping to recycle. But in this case, I, I can recycle by swapping the arrays. Yeah, let's see. Ah. Now, just one, let's see, this is just a, one warning about coding style. The, uh, the comprehension syntax is nice and short and, and simple. And like here, I, I have the, uh, I'm using the, 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 slow, the, the slow ver, well, the, the version that doesn't recycle arrays, because maybe I'd say, wow, well, it's not worth the extra performance. I just want to get on with things. But there is still there's a significant performance hit not having to do with reusing arrays, but with a, a, a type issue here. If I use the comprehension syntax and I don't give it an explicit type, I get whatever the compiler can figure out. And for example, if I pass in a yeah, vector of int 8, are, these, uh, are they the same functions? And you know, they, they behave quite differently. Because the one at the top, if I pass an int 8, then t is of type, an array of int 8 also. The one on the bottom, the result is the, uh, well, whatever the compiler could figure out for that array. I think it figures out the, uh, let's see. oh, it figures out, oh, it's int 64 in this case. Or int, whatever, on a 64-bit machine, it'd be int 64. So the, the, the array is much larger. So the, the recommendation is, uh, I, I, I would not use the comprehension syntax without explicitly specifying the uh, type of the array. So here, the problem is easily fixed by specifying the, the type, of, type of the array I want. Of course, uh, I understand my remark about not using a, a type in front of the comprehension. There's a big difference between interactive use and just hacking around versus a piece of code that you need to run efficient, have to run efficiently. And the nice thing about Julia is you can use the same language for both. Yes, yeah, the mod to the percent to it, it gives you just an int. Yeah, and the trouble is actually that kicks in. Actually, I guess there, yeah, and that kicks into if you, you use this next state inside the uh, previous function I showed. If you use that in in this the, the uh, lower left there, there's a type instability shows up. Then, because it's come, you handed an array of bools that came back with an array of int 60, or you handed an array of int 8 that came back with an array of int 64s, and you assigned it to the uh, variable. So. so, at least my, my takeaway would be be real careful if you're using comprehension syntax without an explicit type. So, it's often a question of what style to write Julia in. 
And unfortunately, I mean, this is where I have to apologize for the language, the state of language right now is the, the loop style tends to run faster than the array style. And the, though I, I hope in the long term, I certainly hope to see the gap closed. But right now, yeah, the, on the left here, I show the array style for a, a kernel. And then on the right, there's the loop style. And this is contrary to people, particularly coming from languages like Python or R or APL, they expect the so-called the array style, which is which is unfortunately is called vectorized, because in the circles I run, vectorized means something else. The, uh, the array style, it, 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 they expect it to run faster, but it, with Julia, it's really the, the loop style usually runs faster because the array style involves uh, temporary arrays. So the gap is starting to shrink. With, with sufficient high-level optimizations, I think eventually we'll get there and they can run the same. I have, yeah, I don't have experience with the devectorized macro. Uh, that's one way, yeah, if you read up on it, that there's this at devec macro that can deal with some codes. But it has this odd limitation that the uh, multiplication, it, because it's dealing with symbols, and before it knows its types, it at least used to not be able to deal with multiplication. Um, yeah. Element Y. Yeah. Uh, though with staged functions, I don't know if it's been re-implemented with staged functions or not, that that would address that issue. Now there's a third way, yeah, there's a third way to write kernels, and that is if you know your blahs or willing to, or willing to dig through the documentation, because uh, almost for every computational pattern that's important for high performance, it's somewhere in the blahs, you just got to find it. Uh, and I had to actually dig a little bit. I didn't know the blahs well enough, but I was able to find a way to express this that way. If your matrices are f sufficiently large, the blah solution will often be the best because maniacs have spent many hours and ye or years optimizing the code for the platform for the blahs. But if the matrices are small, then the overhead of calling the blahs and the setup usually won't pay off. Uh, this code, this kernel actually was very dear to me. This was part of this programming contest that involves CPU, throwing away CPU days. And I actually tried the blah solution and it didn't quite keep up with the, uh, the hand-coded loop. I think, I think that where the blahs lo lose out sometimes, if you hand it, they're, they're like optimized for roughly square matrices, and if you hand long, skinny things, sometimes they, I've seen them fall flat more than once. So my, my takeaway from this is, I mean, don't completely give up on the array style. If it's useful for getting your work done and for getting a prototype going, for heavens, uh, you, use it. Um, particularly if the absolute performance is not critical. And I, I think uh, Julia will get better over time with that. But currently, yeah, there's allocation overhead for the array style. And the, and oh, the other thing is right now there's poor cache behavior for large arrays because you do one operation on two arrays, and if they don't fit in cache, well, the result, if the result doesn't fit in cache, well, then on the next operation where you use that large array, it's got to be sucked in through that little uh, coffee stir again. Whereas with the loop form, it's like you pull in the numbers once through the coffee stir, use them all, and spit out the final result through the coffee stir, and you're, you're done. Uh, I said loop style, yeah, versus blahs depends upon the situation. The, the blahs, if you can find the blahs routine that does it, uh, and your matrices are not too wacko skinny, I'd give it a try. And there's a link to a, a good exposition of the three methods. All right. Optimizations, yeah, there's only, there's only three kinds of optimizations in compilers. There's the automatic kind that just work, there's the kind that need a nudge, and there's the kind you have to do yourself. The, for any optimization, an optimization is something that transforms code. If you're a mathematician, you probably you won't like the name optimization because technically they're not optimizations, they're just uh, bets. A bet that a transform will win most of the time. And it may, in some cases, make code run worse. So for any, any so-called optimization, there's really there's two, two, two questions. That the optimization, optimization has to ask, is this transform legal in this context? And is it likely profitable? It will play the odds on the profitable part. Okay, real basic one that's aut largely automatic, you don't have to worry about, is constant propagation. 
So here's an example of a piece of code. And if you go through and look at the code LLVM, the compiler has figured out that it can rearrange all the algebraically rearrange the arithmetic and uh, combine constants so that what comes out is a single add 8 to this value. Now, the bad thing for integers, compilers are great about doing this sort of thing. You usually don't have to worry about it for integers. For floating point, it's a different story. If I take the same piece of code and look at the LLVM code for it for floating point, I find it hasn't, the compiler has not collapsed all the values together. And the problem is that floating point addition is not associative. So the compiler can't legally do all the algebraic manipulations because for floating point, not all those manipulations are valid. At least from the, uh, Julia, by default, insists upon uh, right answers over fast answers. So it obeys the strict uh, floating point evaluation rules. So let's see. So sometimes you can, you can help things along if you put a little extra, like here, if I take that same code, I parenthesize it slightly differently. So that the, here, the, the uh, what's the key here? I got, yeah, the x here, like a plus 1, the a is known to be a constant to the compiler, a plus 1 is known to be a constant, and now x is known to be a constant. Then x plus 4, they're both constants, so now the compiler can do it just because I added the parentheses to force the evaluation so that the constants were grouped together. But it still can't completely, no, it's still, it's adding 7 and then adding 1. It still, it can't completely collapse it. But if I was really, if I hand wrote this, if I hoist, if I hoist that plus 1, I could by hand move that plus 1 into the, the then and the else parts of the if, then, and else, and group things and reduce that. Or I can apply the, uh, the, the fast math can probably get me out of this. So there's this uh, annotation at sign fast math that you can put around an expression or statement, and it says, uh, do all those uh, algebraic rules that you learned in grade school that are actually Ill totally illegal for floating, po <laughs> floating point. But go ahead and do them, and if we're off by a bit, who cares? So here's some of the list of some of the uns rules that are unsafe. Some of these, I mean, you might wonder, gosh, x plus 0, how can that be wrong? And the answer is, well, 0 is not the identity element for floating point. It's negative 0 is the identity element. Uh, the rule is if you add two zeros, the result is a negative 0 only if the uh, two operands are negative. Likewise, 0 times x. How can that go wrong? It's, no, if x is infinity. This is why in languages like C++ and C++ and Fortran, it is not legal to have your stencil like reach over the edge of the array and think that it's safe just because you know it's a 0 over there. Or no, no, the stencil arm has a zero coefficient. Uh, and these others. Yeah, multiplying by the reciprocal is like, it'll be one bit off. Uh, amazingly, you can multiply, there's a way to multiply by the reciprocal for integers that does work exactly, but <laughs> it doesn't work for floating point. And the integer, integer method requires a little more work. Uh, yeah, association, as I said, doesn't work. And distribution doesn't, doesn't always work. So, but the situation, some people say, well, none of the rules work for floating point. But that's not true either. Some of the rules actually do work as long as so-called signaling NANDs are ignored. And Julie ignores signaling NANDs. In fact, I, I haven't seen a software system that pays. Signaling NAND uh, pays attention to them. So you probably, unless you've used a very old system, you've probably never seen these in your life. These are NANDs. As soon as you touch them for any operation, you're, you, an exception is thrown at that moment. They're really awful to work with, which I suspect is why they're never enabled. Uh, so some of these rules still, uh, as long as signaling NANDs are ignored, a, lot, uh, a few algebraic properties still hold. I said negative 0 is the identity element. Multiplying by 1 still works. Actually, multiplying by powers of 2, or dividing by powers of 2 can be replaced by multiplication by powers of 2. Uh, commutivity uh, still works in the obvious ways. That's actually fundamental to IEEE arithmetic. Uh, the negative of the negative is the same. And that bottom rule is actually the definition of subtraction in IEEE arithmetic. So that one better work. So yeah, here's the fast math macro. I just, here, I, I used the begin-end pair, so I didn't have to write it on every single expression. So 
fast math and a begin end to a bracket it. And then that says everything between that begin end, take liberties with it. And now the compiler can munch things down to the, uh, the single constant. Now, of course, the function that now that's been sloppy, I can find, I can probably find you in with enough effort. Uh, I, yeah, I can find you inputs. Yeah, what was it? I have it in my notes here. Yeah, two raised to the 55th power is now off by eight from the original, the results now off by eight from the original version. Now, these are easy to, uh, uh, machines are so fast now, it's amazing. You can actually do exhaustive search over uh, single precision floating point for these sort of things. And over double precision, you can, if you know roughly where you want to look, you, I did exhaustive search and found the counterexample. Right. Yes? Oh, okay. I have, let's see, exercise, let's see, I have a break already, let's see, just a second, which, where is it? No, let's see, how much later? Maybe we should just move. Yeah, I mean, it might just be, yeah, the is probably going to try people, give them a headache, give people headaches. Do you want to make it, do you want to just move, or do you want people to have 10 minutes to grab a soda and a cookie? How about, yeah, let, let's break, yeah, let, let's break, break for 10 minutes. And where are we setting up? Right 124. 124. And so now I have a, a, a bunch of code, but none, there's no calls here. Well, there's no, all the calls here are uh, so-called intrinsics in Julia, fun functions for which the compiler is going to expand into in, uh, known opcodes in, in the LLVM. So now, yeah. F and div, uh, and div has been inline, because most of the standard, li well, the standard library, it's all functions too, even plus is a function. So that's all been inlined, and so I get a slew of arithmetic ops. And then the compiler will munch that down and figure out the fact that, yes, yeah, in fact, when you divide by two and multiply, by, divide, do an integer divide by two and multiply by two, that's the same as whacking off the low order bit. So the LVM, the, the, it, it knows a lot of these arithmetic tricks. Now, if you want to turn off inlining, uh, you can do that from the command line uh, with the dash dash inline equals no. And I think you'd only want to do that if you're like doing really detailed profiling of the call chains, but it's not, the code's going to run hideously slowly. You can also force inlining with the at inline macro because the, the, the current, in Julia, the compiler just has a heuristic that guess whether inlining is going to be worth the the gain is going to be worth the cost of the code expansion. And sometimes you have your own ideas as to whether it's worth it or not. Maybe in one particular place, it's worth doubling the size of the code to, set, to spend the save 10% execution because, well, that's the only place I'm going to double the size of the code. So in this earlier, the hailstone exercise, actually I found there was a slight uh, win to uh, apply the add inline macro. Yeah, uh, so I, oh, I got about 10% improvement out of it. Is that, did you try it or? Um, uh, no. No, okay. I, so 10% to some people, to our compiler group, uh, like the C compiler, uh, if they get like a few percent, they're jumping up and down, joys of victory. 10% around Julia Co's like, yeah, maybe it's worth it, maybe not. <laughs> Depends if somebody's paying you for that 10% or not. If they're paying you for 10%, you do it. Uh, <laughs> 10% is difference between we get the contract or they get the contract. Yeah, <laughs> you do it. If 10% is I just obfuscated my code by a factor of 10 so nobody ever understand it again, maybe not. Uh. <laughs> yeah, bounds checking in Julia. Okay, Julia checks array subscripts by default. The overhead is actually surprisingly small in most cases on a modern out of order out of order processor because it can overlap the bounds check with a bunch of other stuff. I've seen about 10% you know, about spread for a tight loop, but there's a big asterisk with that. If the bounds checking was stopping vectorization, then it's a big hit. So the way to uh, eliminate a bounds check is to, uh, there, there's an at inbounds macro. You can put it in front of the spot where you want to turn off the bounds checking, or you can 
cram it in front of the for loop. If you want to eliminate all the checking in the for loop. And just the warning is you turn off the bounds checking and you screw up. You can bring down your whole session. You can corrupt data. So be really careful with it. And one good thing is you can turn, if you're like been a little too liberal with inbounds and things are screwing up and you need to catch the bug, uh, you can turn off, you can turn on all the bounds checking with the command line option dash dash check bounds equals yes. And then it'll ignore all the add inbounds. Now, long term, I hope a lot of these examples, like the example here, I, I certainly hope long term that the, uh, the bounds check on P sub i will automatically be eliminated. Uh, and maybe the B sub i, it's conceivable the B sub i check could be eliminated too. Unfortunately, the A sub, whatever P sub i, that's a scatter with indices of unknown, possibly all over the place, that check. It's going to be really hard for a compiler to eliminate. But maybe at least we can get to the point where the vectorizer can like vectorize the bound checks, and then we'll be halfway there. Anybody, any master students looking for a pro compiler project? Uh, vectorizing bounds check is my <laughs> favorite one I want to hand out to somebody. Uh, yeah, hoisting invariants. Um, this is right now the most frustrating thing with Julia for me, is because the, the compiler sometimes does it, and, but other times you have to do it manually. And I understand some places the compiler is never going to be able to do it, but other spots, I think with better compiler technology, we'll get there and hoist more stuff itself. And the key problem, the, que the question is always, is it legal to hoist it? And that comes down to uh, something called alias analysis, figuring out what, uh, whether a how many things refer to a particular memory location. So they can figure out how many things can affect that memory location and possibly change it. So here's a hoisting example where the uh, compiler will do it just, just fine. The, uh, I have a loop here. Now inside I have expression 2a plus 1. Because a is a parameter and it's not exposed to anything else that can change it, the uh, compiler can, as long as it's a scalar value, the compiler can easily figure out that 2a plus 1 is never changing and hoist the evaluation out of the, out of the loop. So hoisting little scalar crud is not worth your time. Let the compiler do it. Uh, loads of fields, unfortunately, is a different story. The code here, I have a, a loop. Wait, where? Yeah, I should say, in this loop here, I have, uh, I'm loading uh, besides 2a plus 1, that's one loop invariant. The other loop invariant is the pointers to fields y and x. Or, and that, those are also technically, those are loop invariants, but the, the current compiler won't catch it. So what you have to do is load those uh, explicitly, like load them into local variables. So here I took q.x and q.y and pull them, pull them up into locals. I don't fully, uh, what is it? It's because our alias analysis is terrible. Basically, and I, I implemented the alias analysis for Julia. Um, right now, I made a, it was a quick rough cut. What we did is we took, we did use something in LLVM called type-based alias analysis, where it partitions, mem you take all of memory and you partition it into different types, and uh, things in the same type, uh, if something's modified of a particular type, you know, something else of that type could be modified, but nothing in another partition. And we, uh, parti uh, I, I partitioned it into, basically, there's a whole bunch of fine-grained partitioning of, of Julia internal data structures. But anything that's accessible by the user is in one big, happy user data partition. And that needs to be refined a bit. But yeah, the hoisting, it, it, it's, it's, it's embarrassing right now. <laughs> what would the penalty be about it in this particular case? Uh, it shot, let's see, I think in this case, it's, it's just a, oh, actually it's embarrassing because it does a null check too as the gotcha. When you, when you refer, the first time it refers to q.x, it has to check whether x was ever assigned a value because there's this risk that x was, a field was never assigned anything and then it's supposed to raise an exception at that point. And so it's, it's actually the check is the killer. It's not the indirection. And the check then, because it's a conditional branch, it kills the vectorization and other things and it cascades. So I, I expect this, so, so my advice is if it's local scalar stuff, don't hoist it by hand, it's a waste of time. But indirect loads off, say, loop subscripts, they're known to be 
constant or fields of structures, you pretty much need, need to hoist them by hand into a local. And I expect the situation to get better in the future. Okay, Unro uh, unrolling loops. Uh, beginners love this one. Um, but my general advice is stay away from it, except in very specialized circumstances and actually, actually checking that it actually runs faster. Because the uh, unrolling loop just means you, you, you like, like here, on the example here on the code on the left, it's like each iteration, the statement does one piece of work, and on the right, each iteration does uh, four, four iterations at once, essentially. The trouble is, it's actually, in this example, it's a huge slowdown in LLVM because it, for, it, it basically uh, confuses the vectorizer. The vectorizer wants to see a nice, simple, uniform access to arrays. And with the form on the right, it's seeing chunk, oop, let's jump by four positions, chunk, jump by four positions. It, it doesn't want to see that. Uh, and the other thing is the unrolling, to really get it right, you have to know a bunch of machine parameters and know what the code looks like. And that's deep down inside the compiler at some certain point in the compilation process. You really don't have enough information to do it right at the, the source level. That said, occasionally there's cases where you can win. But it makes the code ugly, hard to read, and at best buys you a little bit in most cases. So I say stay away. Um, And so it can really backfire when it hits vectorization. All right. This is for, if you're Fortran programmers, you can skip this section. You already know this. If you use any other sane language, nope, sorry. <laughs> you're getting, ever since Algol. Um, I saw a retrospective where Bacchus admitted in the design of Fortran they actually screwed up on this. They misunderstood something about linear algebra at the time. Anyway, Julia arrays are column major, which means they're stored in memory with uh, each column is packed in memory. So that has the, the columns have the unit stride. So, and furthermore, each column, is, the things with the unit stride in, in the computer, uh, computers don't transfer memory individual bytes anymore. They transfer so-called cache lines, typically on the order of 32 to 128 bytes. Uh, on the Intel architectures, it's 64 bytes for a cache line. The, uh, and that's like the minimal, like if you want one byte out of memory, you're going to get the whole, you, you suck up the whole 64 bytes, whether you want it or not. So you have to be careful and consider, consider that. Because you're using that, that thin coffee, sucking through that coffee stirrer, you're, you're, you're sucking through uh, cache lines. So for example, if you, uh, if you, if you, if you walk an array vertically, column by column, you're good because you're pulling whole cache lines in and processing them. The, the bad spot is if you uh, read a row of an array, this is very bad because when you read the row of the array, I said you're, you're not just reading each element, you're reading the cache lines that hold each element. So for this array, you're actually pulling that entire blue section of memory in through the, the coffee stirrer. So just yes, yeah, a, a simple trivial example. On the left is the uh, slow way to traverse a matrix because it's walking the, it's the way a C programmer would naturally write this, or an Algol programmer, or a Java programmer, or any, any of those other languages, yeah. Uh, but it's, it's walking, the, walking row wise and then, uh, then do, moving down to the ne next row. The, uh, the faster way for, and this will show up for matrices that don't fit in cache, is to just simply swap the order of the indices. Now that said, when you have nested loop, uh, an I loop and a J loop, sometimes you can just swap the loops, and sometimes you can't. You have to pay attention to what the loop's doing. Let's see, let's skip, yeah, let's skip the trans translation look aside buffer. Um, other than it's another reason to want to walk arrays carefully. Let's see. OK, there's two more exercises. Uh, given the time constraints, I think I'm going to leave those uh, to do after the class. You can certainly, if, you want, if you want to compare solutions, may, may, uh, send me an email. Maybe I, I should put these down on GitHub site so people can just discuss solutions, because I'm sure my, mine are not the, the best. And some of these, particularly exercise three, 
is like there's a bunch of things you can do and you could eventually just turn it into totally unreadable code. I think there's a question about on that one when to stop. Oh, and that means I have to brush through my, I have the answer key to one of them here. Can I click, 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 no, no, no beacon. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, okay, close with, yeah, vectorization, because this is the important optimization, or important optimization for uh, really using the modern processors. So modern processors, more, as I said earlier, they have uh, arithmetic units that can process multiple, uh, a, vec a small tuple of values just as quickly as a single value. And it's called, in all the literature, it's called vectorization. Unfortunately, vectorization, I guess what, it started in Python or something? They've used, used the term vectorization, mean writing code in this array-oriented style, like Fortran 90. I like to call it the, 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 the array-oriented style, Fortran 90 style. So, yeah, you take two operands or tuples, you add them and get element-wise sum out of it. And it's just as fast in the hardware as a single, a single sum. So here's a simple loop. Um, and to make it the vectorize, it in, what you do in Julia is either the, the compiler automatically vectorize it or you have to tell the compiler to vectorize it. And when you tell the compiler to vectorize it, you're making a bunch of promises and I'll go through the, what you're promising. And you also have to use the inbounds for reason to be explained. And then what the compiler does is it takes that code and transforms it to a form that is, well, for a four-wide SIMD unit, is as if it was written in this way. Yeah, it's a bunch, of, a bunch of tuple math. Uh, but over yeah. there, there's some group loop unrolling, uh, like, like you showed in a previous Yes. Class. Yeah, this is why you want the compiler to loop unroll, because it, it, at this point, it wants to take a nice simple code and, yeah, do the unrolling. If you unroll it, it confuses it and it can't do its unrolling. Well, the effect is it's unrolling. In fact, the vectorizer, if you look at it, that, uh, in LVM, it, it does two things. It applies SIMD and it also does something called interleaved unrolling. Because typically, two of the other things, the optimal uh, chunk width for a loop is not necessarily the, 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 the hardware width. It's usually a little uh, wider by a factor of two or four. Uh, but in, in rewriting the stuff for the tuple math, it's the, the serial order evaluation is, is, is changed. So here, just quickly, if I execute the loop serially, it executes all the first iteration. Uh, and then we go on to the next iteration. The, the subscripts here indicate the iteration number. And so you get the, this sort of pattern. E each column is one iteration of the loop. But if you go uh, with the SIMD, the order is different. The uh, oops, wait. the order is as far as the the guarantee you get from the compiler is that it will do it in any order that is consistent with the order shown here. As each iteration will be done in or each iter the, the code within an iteration will be done in the order you asked it to be done in, but the order between iterations is all bets are off. So the compiler has complete liberty to re reorder stuff. Um, happening in different, in different iterations, it can interleave them arbitrarily. Now in the future, if, if first you got to get LLVM there, in the future, there's going to be probably, a, a, I certainly hope there'll be a tighter order where you'll be guaranteed this pattern. And it turns out that tighter constraints are essential for, cer for certain idioms that show up in like uh, stencil codes. So yeah, the two key questions for vectorization are, is it always legal and is it likely going to be profitable? The uh, profitable part is usually fairly easy for the compiler to answer. It's usually like, do I have all the instructions I need to do this? Like if it need, it's going to vectorize the loop, but it's missing one of the vector instructions. Sometimes it can figure out, well, I can fake with, with a sequence of serial instructions. Other times, like uh, for so-called a, a, a gather or scatter, like an early example where I'm scattering out to a whole bunch of a subscript that's just random values. If you're missing the instruction, it's almost pointless to uh, vectorize. So in answering those questions, sometimes you have to give, you can either depend upon, depend upon the compiler answering the questions, that's called implicit vectorization, where it proves that the 
changing the order of evaluation doesn't change the result, or the compiler will like insert runtime checks and check whether the re changing the order was OK, and like use serial code if it's not OK, and use the vector code if it was OK. The other way is explicit vectorization with at simd, and that's where the, the programmer intervenes and says, yes, I know this loop is safe to, uh, semantically safe to execute in SIMD mode. Go ahead and do it. The, uh, it's technically, SIMD is an experimental feature, but I noticed, what, at least two talks today, or two talks in the last two days, I, I saw SIMD on slides. People were using it, and somebody else thanked me for adding it. I think it's a well-established feature now. And basically, when you use that, you're vouching that rearranging the iteration, uh, the, interleaving the iterations is uh, fine. So, yeah, the runtime check thing, it has to do with whether the input, for the loop body, the inputs and the outputs of the loop, whether they overlap. If two outputs overlap, that makes it unsafe to vectorize by default, or if an input and an output overlap. Uh, the bad thing about the runtime, the runtime check would be great, only it sometimes doesn't work so hot because it, it, it takes quadri time that's quadratic in the number of rays the uh, loop is manipulating. It also has to give up on so-called scatter and gather patterns where the subscripts aren't predictable. So, let's see where, where am I, runtime check, yeah, reductions. Most loop, uh, a lot of loops, uh, particularly with the sort you'd want to vectorize, usually there's a reduction involved, very often so. And so to the, the, technically, the, particularly for floating point, the, the, order, the reduction order matters. And so the compiler has to take some special effort to get that right. And it has to, uh, it has to reassociate things. Let me show. Um, if you think about the, the code, lit uh, the code literally, if you, it's just, a, it's like s plus this value plus this value plus this value. If you say addition is not associative, there's really not much you can do. You have, uh, as for, do as far as speeding that up. You, you have to do it in the order specified. Uh, so what the compiler does, is it, it, to vectorize a reduction, it has to reorder the, reassociate the uh, reduction, basically build a bunch of partial sums that are accumulating uh, parts of the array, and then at the end, it, throws those sums together. So yeah, here's yeah, just the serial order of summation for that example is you add in x1, x2, x3, and so forth. And the vectorization order is, well, I start out with a bunch of partial sums. And then I add in the first four elements. And I add in the next four elements to those partial sums. So, so it's basically a, a tuple of sums. And then near, at the end of the loop, then I will take that tuple of partial sums and crunch it down to a, a single sum using a, a tree structure. But the impact, as far as a programmer, yeah, you really don't care about the, you know, those details. What you care about is the, the impact of the reassociation requirement. Is, uh, the impact is that for implicit vectorization, where the compiler is automatically going to do it for you, it's going to work for integer reductions just fine. It's going to work for fast math floating point reductions fine, because the fast math has said, oh yeah, go ahead and the copy paste error there. You can't bitwise and floating point. I hope we don't allow bitwise and a floating point. <laughs> Simon Byrne, I think, wanted this sort of thing. But you know, the hardcore floating point guys know how to twiddle the bits, but the rest of us don't. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just want so for floating point reductions, you need to mark it with fast math or use the explicit at SIMD. And also for scatter and gather, well, scatter and gathers, I think the L of M, uh, I'm not sure if the L of M vectorizer can handle it right now. The, uh, the next generation Intel chips have scatter and gather instructions, so then it will be interesting, presumably, that, that will, L of M will be able to handle it. The, uh, and not yet implemented for Julius, the, you know, the floating point min max, uh, it, it will not uh, vectorize those. Like those are really tricky. If you look at the definition of floating point min max, uh, Julia uses the IEEE definition, which deals with NANs in tricky ways. Can I the dollar sign? Um, That's a XOR. Oh. Okay. And I think Jeff has expressed re regrets that we've blown the symbols and and or for uh, bitwise operations for a 
user community it probably doesn't care that much about bitwise twiddling. <laughs> Do you know that and A and D and O R are keywords in C? That's something most programmers probably forget. <laughs> yeah, that, we've like tried to name a variable and the compiler yells at you. Uh, all right, yeah, the speed up surprise. I said sometimes the, uh, the SIMD actually can deliver speed ups greater than the SIMD width of the hardware. This came in initially on a GitHub issue <laughs> or something. Uh, somebody observed that, yeah, they, they applied SIMD to a summation example and sped up by 12x. And the hardware was AVX hardware. They only had eight wide SIMD units. And it, this, this seemed like a timing error or something. But no, it actually, this is very, it's very real. What happened was that the vectorizer spotted the, spotted the opportunity and said, well, actually, I don't want to operate on, well, the, the, here, the example here is for four wide hardware because I want to fit it on the slide. But this shows how four wide hardware can give you a much bigger speed up than four, 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 uh, four X is when you say is, well, OK, I, the, the programmer said the, iter the order in which I do the reductions doesn't matter. So I can separate the reduction into eight partial sums. And I can deal with four of them with one SIMD instruction. And then the other fourth, another SIMD instruction, those two instructions, uh, they have a certain latency, but they, uh, they can overlap more or less. Like they have a latency of about three, but you can issue them one, out of, uh, one per clock. So it's like you can feed the hardware, yeah. One operation, then the next, then the next, and then the next, and they, they can hand over hand be computing these sums and keeping the hardware buzzing. So yeah, the SIMDs basically enabled this. Um, I guess the, the fast math reductions in print probably enables that too. I, I don't know if LLVM exploits it or not for just plain scalar stuff. So yeah, the point is, yeah, the, the, that SIMD sometimes could, I, it enables not just the SIMD units, it also sometimes enables instruction level parallelism that wasn't otherwise usable. In some cases, in fact, the LVM, it'll like, it can't use the SIMD units at all because of scatter and gather or something, but it, it'll still uh, exploit the, the, the SIMD marker, give enough latitude to uh, do this overlap game and speed things up for even given the scatter and gather, even though the loop is still scalar code. So yeah, for vector, uh, vectorization, yeah, the recommendations, you do have to cater to the vectorizer. It is a, uh, a, a picky client. Uh, you have to have no cross iteration dependencies. There's one, the, the result of one iteration can't affect the result of another iter iteration. The trip count of the loop has to be obvious. So usually that just means use the regular four syntax in, in Julia. It's not, it's not a big deal for Julia. It's a bigger deal for C and C++ where the for loop syntax is, uh, allows much creativity. The, uh, the loop, okay, a limitation LLVM's vectorizer is the loop body must be straight line code, no branches. It can deal, uh, uh, I think I have an example, there's like real simple branches, like a, a brief little and, uh, uh, logical and logical or a small question mark call and sometimes it can like remove it, but most, uh, if it's very complicated, it'll give up. And the subscript should be a unit stride. So here, yeah, no cross iteration dependencies. Basically, each iteration better not be reading or writing data that's read or written. Or the only thing you're, all iterations can read shared data, but they better not be writing any shared data. Except for reduction variables, which is a special pattern, and those have to be uh, that has to be done with local scalar variables. You, must not reduce into a global variable. And oh, another fine point. It'd be hard in Julia to, to break this one. No iteration is allowed to wait on another. Like if we had locks in Julia, you can't have one iteration acquiring a lock um, and waiting for another iteration to release that lock because they're all marching in lockstep. It's just it's going to wait a long time for the lock to be released. The, uh, OK, and the other remark about yeah, the SIMD right now is not the same as a classic vectorizable loop. I hope maybe in the future to fix things. But it requires deep LLVM fixing. And it depends upon the outcome of certain C++ committee debates. OK, the trip count, it must be obvious. That's easy. Just, just use the plain the for loop syntax. Yeah.
Ooh. Is it recommended to use each index rather than one of the links? I'll have to check that. Yeah, I, I didn't know about that, that new function. All right. Th th this is an important point. Yeah, we may have to, uh, if it doesn't, wor doesn't work, yeah, there's some work to be done on the SIMD macro. Well, I, I don't know. I thought that there's a possibility that each index knows that it can benefit from the other index. Yeah. 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 All right, I'll have to, have to look, because I remember, yeah, we did, we did fix the uh, at SIMD macro to handle some of the Cartesian stuff better. But it sounds like it's going to need some more work. Okay, yeah, loop body needs to be straight line code. All the, and straight line means really straight, no, no jumping off to a subroutine. Uh, this, is just, 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 this is just a limitation of the LLVM vectorizer as it currently stands. So that means you have to get all that stuff about type inference, being nice to the, uh, the inference mechanism. Get yeah, that? That applies very strongly here. Just screw up and just leave one generic dispatch, and there's no way the loop's going to vectorize. So yeah, make your code type. Make sure it's type stable. Make sure there's no exception constructs, because the exception constructs. Uh, the problem is it's actually it's the branch that's impl implied by them. It's, it's, there's some check, and oh, do I need to throw something here? And the branch. Now, if there's a branch, it's no longer straight line code. So turn off bounds check. You, right now, yeah, for subscripts, use at inbounds to turn off the bounds checking. Uh, like square root, you need to turn off the check for negative argument with fast math. So the short logical operations sometimes work, but if you really want to be sure, use the function. There's a function if else in Julia that forcibly evaluates its two uh, conditional arms. No, now they're unconditional arms, and then chooses the value based on the predicate. So, yeah, just the example, it shows it actually sometimes works. Oh, and a way to check where vectorization has actually occurred. What you do is you look at, the way to check is look, use code LLVM, and you'll see gobs of code. You don't have to, don't panic. What you do is all you do is you look for a label called vector.body. If the vectorizer struck, you'll see vector.body in the loop. And the other thing to look for is this, that 8 times float indicates it's a tuple, that's LLVM's terminology for a tuple of 8 floats. You see that 8 times float or 4x float or you know, next generation Intel processor 16x float, uh, then, that's the sign that's been vectorized. But yeah, the key is that this vector dot body is the mark it leaves behind. And, and you see vector dot what, ph. I think there's a vector dot middle. So lots of labels. Vector dot something. Uh, can, can you uh, do code native as well and check for uh, vectorized uh, machine instructions? Oh, you, you could, though it's hard to <laughs> This is terrible an Intel person saying this, but it's much harder to read than the LLVM. <laughs> Because particularly, yeah, the the, uh, the vectorizer at that level, yeah. If you're if you're comfortable with native code, you could. But I find that the uh, it, it's harder to read because the labels are not symbolic. These two, I just I look for vector dot body. I know them. I know it. The vectorizer struck. With the code native, you don't get symbolic branch labels. Is the problem. So yeah, subscript should be unit stride. Here's an example that the vectorizer will give up on because there's this little two times i there. So you, so actually, oh, this one, I remember, yeah, it, it actually, last time I tried this, it vectorized for float 32. The vectorizer still carried on, said, oh gosh, you asked for it to be vectorized, I'll, try, I'll do it. But it had to, because it was missing the instructions to pick up every element, every other element of the array, it had to synthesize those from serial instructions, so it was a little bit slow. But it still managed, wait, it managed to win. Yeah, that part, it was, the, the reference to x2 times i was slow, but somehow it managed to pick, make up for the loss in the times and the plus. Uh, 2D arrays or vectorized fine, just make sure that you have a unit stride subscript. 
So this gets back to that column, uh, traversing arrays uh, column-wise on the inner loop. So this loop, as long as I, uh, I have the inner loop is the, the I loop, it, it vectorizes just fine. So this is, this is actually the first time in the last few days I've seen something about Julia that I think is a bad decision. Uh, so what's the rationale for, for doing this column major? Uh, because the Blas and Fortran, yeah. That's, that's it. it's historical. Now, I think there's been some push to have a, a array views and these other, there's some schemes where maybe we'll have a, a C view, programmer's view of an array and a Fortran programmer's view of an array, but I, I sympathize strongly with it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's a QWERTY keyboard thing. And Matt, you know, so it's Fortran and then MATLAB. So the, uh, So yeah, summarize for, for vectorization, yeah, the, the, the programmer has some responsibilities to get this right, right? to make it happen and make sure the answers are right. Uh, for both the implicit and explicit, uh, you have to get, make sure that there's no cross iteration dependencies, because if there are, even if you force the vectorization, you're going to get some screwy answer you, you weren't expecting. Uh, the loop body needs to be straight line code for, for now. I hope that the, the next generation Intel hardware, the so-called the, the Skylake chips, not only do they have wider vector units, they have support for masking, which will make loop bodies with uh, conditional tests in it more amenable to vectorization. In fact, even already, the Intel compiler can take like a three page, uh, loop bodies, three pages of code with switch statements and looks hor and internal for loops and actually vectorize it. Uh, hopefully some of that technology will work its way into LVM. And yeah, you have to make sure your, your subscripts are unit stride for now. Now maybe the next, the next generation, hard, the Skylake hardware, that should improve too. So then for implicit vectorization, you need, the loop binding needs to access just a, a few arrays. And if you have floating point reductions, you need to mark them with the fast math. You don't have to mark poison the whole loop with fast math. It's just that little S plus equals. You need that, that little, the, the plus operation needs to somehow be subjected to the fast math mark to say, yeah, I'll tolerate some reordering. So ex for explicit vectorization, you can use at SIMD. Once again, you have to ensure there's no cross-iteration dependencies because the compiler just, if there are some, the compiler is going to vectorize it anyway because you promised there were no cross-iteration dependencies when you, when you wrote at SIMD. And you just get wrong answers if you were wrong. And use local scalars for reductions. So all that said, you might have to uh, rethink. <laughs> this is the sort of thing, you don't want to write your code and get it done, written, and then say, oh, I want to make it faster, and then find out you made some design decisions that are going to hurt. You really want to rethink some of the stuff at the start, particularly how your, if you know where your uh, core loops are going to be, where the time's going to be spent, you might give some thought as to how your data structures are going to lay out so you're nice to the hardware. So here's an algorithm that does a cumulative sum, right words across an array. As e each row, it, it, do, it does a, a sum. And obviously, the, the code on the left, it's going to be fairly slow because it's, it's fighting the hardware, because it's, it's going row-wise, and the arrays are stored column-wise. So the way to fix that is to, uh, it's a little tricky here. The, or no, let's see, downwards. Oh, oh. And then one way to fix this is say, well, gosh, I really don't want to do uh, sums across rows. Let's just implement something that does sums across columns and make the user supply stuff in that form. So that's what the code on the other side does. And it just, what is it? all I did was, oh, sorry. No, this, uh, let's see. So I got preview of the next slide. I keep my eyes running to the wrong slide. Yeah, this one I just, uh, I basically redefined what the function does and made it sum vertically instead of horizontally. The other way, well, suppose you really, really, really wanted to sum horizontally. Well, then you just have to rethink the algorithm to be friendlier. So on the left is the original code, and then on the right is how I, I'm still, I'm going to make a code that does the cumulative sum to the right. But what I'm going to do to be friendly to the hardware is I, t I, I want to interchange the loops. But to do that, I have to change my scalar s into an array. So basically, I keep around an array that's a, the current running sum of, the rows, of each row so far. 
And then I can march across, the, the, the loops can just march across the array vertically and keep updating those sums. And even though I am allocating an array instead of a scalar, I mean, this looks way worse because I'm dealing with this arrays and subscripts. But in fact, actually, it, 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 the situation is actually much better because not only am I traversing the hardware, uh, the, the, the memory efficiently, I've also actually broken a uh, latency issue with the way the sum is accumulated. So here's some timing data. Yeah, this is normalized uh, nanoseconds per element updated. So I can compare different size arrays, roughly. In the original, the, uh, the blue line at the top, so lower is better. This is time per element update. At the top is the original function. And then the orange line is the, the transpose version that sums vertically. And you can see for small arrays, we don't care. The whole array fit in the, you know, the, ca the, the innermost cache, who cares? But once the array is big enough to not fit, eh, then we start getting into, the, the, they separate. And then there's a big separation. Notice that's a log scale on the, the vertical axis and, and on the horizontal axis. There's a big separation eventually. And then that, uh, the very last version that did the array of partial sums it's actually, it's slow. for small arrays, yeah, it's slower. It's more, more, more bookkeeping to do. But if the arrays are large enough, it, it's significantly faster. But eventually, I, th I guess on the very end, it starts to slow down. I guess that's because its own internal array is starting to sp either spill out a cache or just playing the big array we're pulling stuff into. is it, We're limited by the bandwidth of, of the memory at that point. No, we, right. You have to copy out the group twice. Yeah, we don't have the nice, the elegant open MP sort of stuff yet. I want to make sure I'm not missing something neat here. So our sum was the, we, we kind of moved in the wrong order. Yes. At least the second version. And that separates the E sum, which is the better version. Right. But then when we go to the infinity, you've gone back to R sum. I've gone down to R sum, but I interchanged the loops. So it's walking the array, walking the input array in the preferred order. So it's yeah, it's not the same as the original. It's using that. Or, it, yeah, it's still uh, the, the, the innermost. Yeah, the, the loop is, uh, was the innermost loop is an I loop. It's, yeah, it's walking columns of, of A here. It's just the, the point was to do the bookkeeping. If I'm going to walk columns, I need an ar array of partial sums, not just a single scalar to hold the partial sum. Uh, another point here, just to make it, is particularly if you're coming, if, if you're one of these old programmers like me that used to write assembly code, it used to be like you knew that multiplying by power two was fast because you could do it with a shift. And therefore, there's this temptation to make array bat dimensions, powers of two. Don't do that. <laughs> it is not your friend. Pick some wild and wacky number. It's usually better. <laughs> the, uh, because these days, multiplication is really cheap. What's expensive is this memory access. And there's gobs of hardware in the machine to optimize memory access. And unfortunately, gobs of that hardware is based upon powers of two. And so if your powers of two happen to interfere with their powers of two, it's a disaster. So here, the, uh, just an example, here's those routines run on some different matrix sizes. And what I did is around powers of two, I ran a whole bunch of like power of two minus eight, power of two minus seven, power of two minus six. I ran a small spread of, of sizes near powers of two. And you can see the time spikes right when you hit the power of two. And what's happening is like, yeah, it's in like the, the, if you know about caches, there's these associative sets. And the associative sets only look at certain bits in the address. And if two things end up in this, basically if two things end up, if a whole bunch of things, if it's eight-way associative, that means it can hold eight things in the associative set. And if you put uh, 16 items in it, well, eight of them didn't fit and it got blown out to the next level in the memory hierarchy. But just the general takeaway if you're not a hardware fan is powers of two are not your friend as the leading dimension of an array. Now, for the last dimension, we don't care. That one doesn't affect the indexing. So to summarize, yeah, there's a memory hierarchy, and the memory bandwidth is the limiting resource. It's like a coffee stirrer that's been crushed. Uh, the cache line, and when you ask for a piece of memory, you don't just get that memory. You, ask for, you get the entire cache line. The cache lines are about 64 bytes. Julia arrays are column major. Like, just like Fortran and MATLAB. They're not row major like every other language on the planet. <laughs> um, 
Is what? R. Oh, okay. Another. <laughs> Probably for the same reason. Got bind against blahs. Yep. The QWERTY keyboard has. There's the reasons for QWERTY keyboards. Yeah. Same reason Java uses C syntax. All right, the hardware can keep multiple operations in flight, so sometimes break, particularly on tight loops on accumulation, sometimes breaking the, the tight, accumulating in the two variables, uh, or uh, and not having one operation, not having the next operation depend upon the result of the immediate previous operation um, is a good thing. And finally, yeah, using the SIMD units. Make, run your code so that uh, you can use the SIMD units can be a big uh, improvement. But it has to be, the, the loop body has to be very uniform, straight line code. And that's just actually a very high level rule for uh, writing performant code. You want everything to look the same and be uniform. You don't want special cases. The special cases involve branches, and branches are about the slowest instruction on the modern hardware. I'm sorry, unpredictable branches are the slowest instruction. Predictable branches are cheap. The predictor predicts where they're going to go, and it's like it wasn't there. So, yeah, as far as transforms for constant propagation, uh, leave it to the compiler. Uh, you might need to help it with fast math in the floating point cases or by careful grouping. Likewise, yeah, for algebraic simplifications, for floating point, you may have to do it or, or give the fast, fast math liberty. For inlining, the, uh, I, you know, I, for Julie, I've been happy with the inline heuristics for most cases. I, I really haven't done a lot of at inline. Uh, but if you want to, you can mark function with that inline, and you can disable with this dash inline equals no if you want to turn it all off. Eliminating bounds checks, you can use at inbounds, and you can also use dash dash check bounds to turn to force checking, even though you've marked up your code. Or if you're feeling really uh, adventurous, you can do check bounds equal no and turn off all bounds checking in the system. I could see using that for a batch job, maybe. Definitely not interactive. I, I'm too clumsy. <laughs> uh, yeah, hoisting loop invariant, small scalar crud, just let the compiler do it. For field and subscript references, right now you have to do it by hand, and I think that situation will improve in the future. I said unrolling loops, I am a big, uh, I, I recommend strongly against not doing it unless it's a very special situation and it's really time that it really improves stuff. And it's really worth obfuscating your code for a few percent speed up. Or, uh, in vectorization, now that's a big win, and the compiler does it, but you've got to kind of give it a, some nudges. You, uh, you, use, you have to use inbounds right now on the loop body or on the loop. Somehow, oh, you have to turn off the bounds checking within the loop somehow, and you need, sometimes you need to use at SIMD to assist. For types, yeah, concrete types run much faster. Hardware understands concrete types. You want to avoid boxing and generic dispatch overhead. So you want to pay real attention to how type inference is going to go for your code in the, in the tight kernels. If the code is not executed much, and for like user interface stuff that's not compute intensive, don't worry about it. Let the garbage collector do the work for you. It's, don't, if you didn't believe in using a garbage collector at all and didn't believe in using fancy automatic dynamic dispatch <coughs> occasionally, gosh, might as well use C. Yeah. Okay, global vari yeah, in compute the kernels though, avoid global variables and make sure your types are can be inferenced. And use the code uh, warn type to display possible issues. And then, yeah, if you want to be generic, don't use abstract types for generality, use parametric types. But still, abstract types are good. They're great for uh, overloading, and they're good for uh, preventing accidents. If you have something that only works for reals, I mean, mark the parameters for, for reals so it's not accidentally invoked for something else. It's always better to catch an error earlier than 10,000 instructions later. So I just wanted to close. Yeah, I suggested uh, just a general uh, program structure is at the very high level code that's not executed much. You use the types for the direct control flow, the dispatch instead of switch statements. And you use the, uh, the types to protect against accidents. And then those call routines that down in the call chains call like setup routines that like load global variables. And then those call your kernels where everything is passed in as parameters and the types are all inferred accurately. 
and the loops are marked SIMD, and you, that's where it's those leaf routines, that's where you want to help the compiler. And in some cases, maybe find a way to call the blahs. So that's it. There's, as I said, there were two more exercises I sort of skipped through on the, uh, the homework problems. So the, the number three is interesting because there's, it's probably infinite, the number of things you can do for it. I was looking for, I, I'm basically looking for, there's, there's two big wins. That, like, I forget, it. it's like a factor, at least 10, maybe 50 or something. And, and uh, exercise four, I'm just looking for it. There's a real simple two-line change. All right, thank, thank you all for attending. Yeah. I have parts of the vectorization slides, an old copy of the vectorization slides online on a blog, but uh, eventually I'll, I'll put up the rest of the slides after I fix the bugs. Okay. Uh, where will you put them up? Probably, I, I, with the, the plan is to put all the slides up on uh, some sites associated with the conference, but I don't think it's been settled. Where, I'm not sure exactly where they're going to live. I think that right now, I think uh, MIT, I think, has offered some space to publish stuff. So yeah, they, they will show up somewhere. Yes? My comment about each index has checks in it. Uh, when you have an array, it's the equivalent of one color of money up to the list. The, the reason that it's good practice is if you're going to iterate over sparse arrays or something like that, it, it does it in the right order. Ah. Uh, yes? Yeah. Oh, SLP vectorizer, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm the one that checked in the changes for that. So I <laughs> it, uh, what we're trying to talk, right now, it, it operates if you use a dash uppercase O option on Julia, it kicks in. What it can do, it's, the trouble is it eats up a lot of compile time and only hits a certain specialized cases. Where it kicks in is if you define little functions that do tuple math. Like you define a pl operator pl a plus that takes a tuple of four elements, uh, two tuples of four elements, and does element-wise addition. If you define it in the obvious way, the SLP vectorize will kick out a, a SIMD instruction that does the same. At least it used to. I'm pretty sure it used to when I checked it in, because that's what was targeted. So LLVM is always in flux, so I'm never... <laughs> if somebody's broken it or not. And I think at one point I remember it breaking. I thought I checked in the change to fix that. And the it, would be, it would be awesome if, if, you, if that could be like a flag that you could turn on and you would get like pre-compiled packages like mm. that lands. That'd be awesome to yeah. be able to turn on just the pre-compiled stuff. Yeah, that's a good. Yeah, it's expensive because it has to just look through all possibilities and it, it block through. I can match up. Yeah. Um, I keep hearing that threading is coming. And That's uh, or, or, I mean, I, in, in my past, I dealt with processes using accessing shared memory. You had to deal with cache line confounding <coughs> effects and cache line alignment and all that. Yeah. Um, they pay me good money for that stuff. <laughs> I, what, I, what I was wanting to know is since, since threading is definitely coming to Julia, uh, if you could have an advanced talk. Maybe oh, next time. Year, <laughs> um, more of the parallel stuff, because that's that's tricky. That's really hard to get right. This is great stuff. All right. Th yeah. Thanks for the suggestion. That's yeah. The multi-threading. That's the next next workshop or the work the workshop following this. I mean, they're going to talk about the current state of things. Okay, I guess we're done. For yeah.